2020 open meeting of the Federal Communications Commission. Madam Secretary, would you please introduce our agenda for the morning? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you and good morning, Commissioners. For today's meeting, you will hear eight items for your consideration. First, you will consider an order on remand that would respond to the remand from the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and conclude that the Restoring Internet Freedom Order promotes public safety, facilitates broadband infrastructure deployment, and allows the Commission to continue to provide lifeline support for broadband Internet access service. Second, you will consider a report and order that would establish a 9 billion 5G fund for rural America to ensure that all Americans have access to the next generation of wireless connectivity. Third, you will consider a report and order that would increase opportunities for unlicensed white space devices to operate on broadcast television channels 2 to 35 and expand wireless broadband connectivity in rural and underserved areas. Fourth, you will consider a report and order that would further accelerate the deployment of 5G by providing that modifications to existing towers involving limited ground excavation or deployment would be subject to streamlined state and local review pursuant to Section 6409A of the Spectrum Act of 2012. Fifth, you will consider a report and order that would authorize AM stations to transition to an all digital signal on a voluntary basis and would also adopt technical specifications for such stations. Sixth, you will consider a report and order that would expand audio description requirements to 40 additional television markets over the next four years in order to increase the amount of video programming that is accessible blind and visually impaired Americans. Seventh, we will consider a report and order that would modernize the commission's unbundling and resale regulations, eliminating requirements where they stifle broadband deployment and the transition to next generation networks, but preserving them where they are still necessary to promote robust intermodal competition. Eighth, you will consider an enforcement action. This is your agenda for today. The first item entitled Restoring Internet Freedom, Bridging the Digital Divide for Low-Income Consumers, Lifeline and Link-Up Reform and Modernization will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau and Chris Monteith, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary and Chief Monteith. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you and commissioners. The Wireline Competition Bureau is pleased to present for your consideration an order on remand that if adopted, would conclude that the Restoring Internet Freedom Order promotes public safety, facilitates broadband infrastructure deployment for internet service providers, and allows the commission to continue to provide universal service lifeline support for broadband internet access service. I would like to thank the entire Bureau team for their hard work on this item, as well as our colleagues in the consumer and governmental affairs, enforcement, international, media, public safety and homeland security, and wireless telecommunications bureaus, and the offices of economics and analytics and general counsel for their review and helpful input. Anik Banum, attorney advisor in the Wireline Competition Bureau's Competition Policy Division will now present the item. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and commissioners. In the 2017 Restoring Internet Freedom Order, the Commission ended the short-lived utility-style regulation of the Internet and returned broadband Internet access service to its long-standing classification as an information service under Title I of the Communications Act. In 2019, the D.C. Circuit upheld the vast majority of the Restoring Internet Freedom Order, remanding three discrete issues for further consideration. Namely, the effect of that order on one, public safety, two, the regulation of poll attachments, and three, universal service support for low-income consumers through the Lifeline program. 
This order on remand, if adopted, would conclude that after reviewing each of these three issues, there is no basis to alter the Commission's conclusions in the Restoring Internet Freedom Order. It would further conclude that the overwhelming benefits of Title I classification of broadband internet access service and restoration of light touch regulation outweigh any potential adverse effects. Specifically, the order on remand would find, first, that the light touch approach adopted by the Commission and the regulatory certainty provided by the Restoring Internet Freedom Order benefit public safety and further the Commission's charge of promoting safety of life and property and the national defense through the use of wire and radio communications. Second, that the benefits of returning to the light touch information service classification adopted in the Restoring Internet Freedom Order far outweigh the limited potential negative effects resulting from the loss of Section 224 poll attachment rights for broadband only internet service providers. Third, that the Commission has legal authority under Section 254E of the Communications Act to provide lifeline support to eligible telecommunications carriers that provide broadband service over broadband capable networks that support voice service. The order would clarify the Commission's legal authority to ensure that broadband internet access services can continue to be funded under the Lifeline program consistent with the DC Circuit's ruling and Section 254 of the Communications Act, and to make necessary adjustments to the Commission's rules to implement this approach. Finally, that the order on remand is consistent with the procedural requirements of the Administrative Procedure Act and the First Amendment. The Bureau recommends adoption of this order on remand and requests editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bonoon, for your presentation, Ms. Monteith as well. We'll now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will submit a longer statement for the record, but make a couple comments. In the Restoring Internet Freedom Order, the Commission reclassified broadband as an information service and restored it to the light touch regulatory treatment that helped allow the internet to flourish. As a matter of law, economics, and public policy, this decision was undoubtedly correct. Similarly, today's order addressing the various remands from the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit does a sufficient job reinforcing the Commission's sound approach and showing why our previous actions should stand. Though this order would ideally provide certainty and finality to this matter, the truth is some will always seek to return to the broken Title II regime, including its misguided approach to paid prioritization, which I have discussed elsewhere at length. We must therefore be careful not to take actions that would undermine the RIF order or make it vulnerable. Rather, we need to apply its legal and economic underpinnings consistently across our proceedings. I thank the Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carter. Thanks. COVID-19 <clears throat> has altered the lives of so many Americans. Daily routines like driving to work, sending the kids off to school, or even catching up with friends were upended. As social distancing recommendations spread across the country, Americans recreated those routines online in an instant. In turn, internet providers saw a sudden 30% spike in traffic levels. Now, that may not sound like a lot in the abstract, but that's the equivalent of fast forwarding about two years worth of traffic growth and putting it onto the network overnight. In this sense, COVID-19 represented the ultimate stress test of America's communications networks. And those networks performed when it mattered most. Our fixed wireless net, our fixed networks showed strength and resiliency. And those networks, our, our fixed network showed strength and resiliency. Consumers experienced essentially zero degradation in service and speeds on our mobile wireless networks actually increased during the pandemic. More than just testing our physical networks, the sudden spike in internet traffic served as the ultimate test of America's approach to internet regulation. While our networks delivered high quality service, 
despite elevated traffic levels, countries that take a heavier or utility style approach to regulating the internet were not so fortunate. Their networks strained to maintain quality and speed. Across the Atlantic, EU officials asked Netflix and other streaming platforms to reduce their video quality to prevent the continent's networks from breaking. Even with those measures, fixed download speeds in Europe were far slower than in the US. And in China, internet speeds dropped 40%. America's communications networks performed because of the record-breaking levels of infrastructure investment we've seen over the past few years. While the US has only 4% of the world's population, it enjoys 25% of the broadband investment. And that's not an accident. Since the FCC's 2017 Restoring Internet Freedom Order, providers have been deploying high-speed networks at a record clip. We're seeing more miles of fiber and a greater number of high-speed cell sites getting built than at any point in time before. Internet speeds in the US have nearly doubled since our 2017 decision, and the digital divide narrowed by about 37% over the past few years. Competition has increased as well, with the percentage of Americans with more than two options for high-speed internet service increasing by 52%, all while prices have been decreasing. The bottom line, America's communications networks were in far better shape to handle the surge in COVID-19 traffic than they were under the commission's Title II regime. More communities were connected to robust and resilient services. More Americans had a choice for their broadband needs. This should put the debate over utility-style regulation of the internet in the rearview mirror once and for all. And it should focus all of us on what really matters, continuing to close the digital divide and making sure every American has a fair shot at next generation connectivity. In the end though, the fight over net neutrality at the FCC has never really been about net neutrality. That's just the sheep's clothing. It's always been about rate regulation, a surefire way to kill innovation and scare off investment. In closing, I want to express my deep thanks to the staff of the Wireline Competition Bureau for all their work on this item. It has my support. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. I support net neutrality. I believe the Federal Communications Commission got it wrong when three years ago it gave the green light to our nation's broadband providers to block websites, throttle services, and censor online content. I believe this decision put the agency on the wrong side of the public, the wrong side of history, mm -hmm. and the wrong side of the law. When we went down this road three years ago over my dissent, 86% of the American public disagreed with the FCC's decision, 86%. They found it crazy that a handful of unelected officials in Washington could limit where we go and what we do online. They found it bananas that the FCC, the agency charged with overseeing communications in this country, would somehow insist that it shouldn't have oversight responsibility for broadband. They found it absurd that the agency would abandon the net neutrality principles that made our internet the envy of the world. What the public understood, and the FCC did not, is that this openness is revolutionary. It means you can go where you want and do what you want online, without your broadband provider getting in the way or making choices for you. It means every one of us can create without permission, build community beyond geography, organize without physical constraints, consume content we want, when we want it and where we want it, and share ideas not just around the corner, but across the globe. I believe it is essential that we honor this history and sustain this openness in the future. And that is why I support net neutrality. Today, we had the opportunity for a do-over. A court sent the mess this agency made with net neutrality back to the FCC. It told us our decision was wrong for public safety, wrong for broadband infrastructure, and wrong for low-income households. It told us try again. But this order on remand makes apparent this agency is not interested in getting it right. Instead, it doubles down 
rather than recognizing the realities of the world around us. We are in a pandemic. It has filled our hospitals, crashed our economy, and emptied our schools. So much of daily life has been upended, but the one thing that this moment has proven with certainty is how necessary it is to be online. This is true for work, for education, for healthcare, and more. This pandemic has demonstrated that access to broadband is no longer nice to have, it is need to have for everyone, everywhere. We need a 100% policy. We need 100% of us connected to broadband, just like with electricity, just like with water. That's because no individual, no household, and no community will have a fair shot at digital age success without it. We're not there yet, far from it. The rollback of net neutrality did not get us any closer to broadband for all, despite the lofty promises made by the FCC. You see it in the reports of the digitally disconnected all around the country. We have adults sitting in cars and parking lots just to catch Wi-Fi to go online for work. We have kids lingering outside of fast food restaurants with laptops just to get a wireless signal so they can go to online class. We have cities and towns fearful that they will not survive this crisis without new efforts to extend broadband to their residents and businesses. And much like the effects of the virus itself, those who are struggling are disproportionately from groups that for too long have suffered systemic discrimination. Again, we need 100% of us connected to broadband and we need that access to be open Today, this agency will tell you that openness and net neutrality is not necessary. But know this, broadband providers have the technical ability and business incentive to discriminate and manipulate your traffic. And this agency has blessed their ability to do so. And when they do, you'll be stuck because FCC data show that our broadband markets are not competitive. Most households in this country have no choice of broadband provider. So if your broadband provider is blocking websites, you have no alternatives. The FCC will say head to the Federal Trade Commission, but the FTC is not the expert agency for communications. The FCC will say head to state consumer protection authorities. But remember, this administration is suing states that tried to fill in the net neutrality and broadband void created when the FCC stepped out. The decision before us today was an opportunity to step back in. It was an opportunity to rethink this agency's rollback of net neutrality from top to bottom and front to back. I regret that it is not. Instead, it is a set of three cobbled together arguments designed to tell the court to go away, the public that we are not interested in their opinion, and history that we lack the humility to admit our mistake. First, the court told the FCC that it failed to address the harm done to public safety by the rollback of net neutrality. The very first sentence of the Communications Act tasks the FCC with promoting the safety of life and property. In other words, public safety is fundamental to our mission. But the agency disregards it here and sidesteps the concerns of the court by insisting that removing net neutrality increases network investment, which will accrue to the benefit of public safety. The evidence for this is less than clear. But more importantly, it doesn't adequately explain that this is ever the case when lives are on the line. Nor does it detail in any meaningful way how first responders will manage when emergency communications are blocked or throttled. This concern is not just theoretical. Among those opposing the FCC's rollback of net neutrality are firefighters who found their service throttled when they were responding to a raging blaze. But here their fears are given short shrift. The agency simply concludes that the elimination of net neutrality is worth the risk, even when lives are at stake. This is irresponsible. Second, the court told the FCC that it failed to address the harm done to broadband infrastructure by the rollback of net neutrality. Section 224 of the Communications Act gives cable and phone companies rights to attach their facilities to utility poles when they deploy service. But when the FCC took away net neutrality, it meant new broadband providers were no longer subject to this section of the law. In other words, the agency eliminated an essential way to ensure broadband providers have rights when it comes to one of the most costly aspects of deployment, pole attachments. 
Now, the FCC tries to explain this isn't a big deal, but it is. Broadband is the infrastructure of the future. If we want to reach 100% of us, and we should, removing tools that help is a bad idea. But this decision concludes it's a price worth paying for the rollback the agency wants. Third, the court told the FCC that it failed to address the harm done to broadband in low-income households by the rollback of net neutrality. Section 254 of the Communications Act details the FCC's universal service programs, including Lifeline. Lifeline is the only FCC program designed to help low-income Americans afford the cost of communications. So when the FCC's net neutrality decision undermined the basis for supporting broadband through the Lifeline program, it was natural for the court to call foul. And in response, the agency just dodges. It ignores the fact that in Section 254, universal service is defined as an evolving level of telecommunication service, and it offers a hodgepodge of citations the claim that its decision did not destabilize the Lifeline program. But it did, because there's no question the program is on less firm legal footing than it was before, and that's a shame. The future of communications is broadband, and this program should reflect that. Modernizing it is how we reach 100% of us, but this decision puts that at risk. That brings us to Section 230 of the Communications Act. It has been in the news lately as we all grapple with the frustrations of social media. Three years ago, the FCC insisted that Section 230's references to a competitive free market for internet compelled this agency to roll back net neutrality. It was bunk at the time. But now the agency's approach to Section 230 is even more confounding because following a push from the administration, the FCC has reversed course. It now insists that this provision of the law compels the agency to regulate certain speech online. In the end, it's not just the hypocrisy that disappoints or the intellectual contortions required to make sense of this. It's the dishonesty. It can't be that the FCC points to Section 230 to disavow authority over broadband, but then uses the same law to insist it can turn around and serve as the president's speech police. What a mess. All of this is not good for consumers, for businesses, for anyone who consumes and creates online. I dissent because it doesn't have to be this way. We can have an FCC that is responsive to consumers. We can have an FCC that accepts nothing less than connecting 100% of us to broadband. So everyone, everywhere has a fair shot in the digital age. We can have an FCC that restores net neutrality rather than doubles down on reasons to take it away. I still believe these things are possible. I still have faith that as a nation, we can make them happen. We can revisit these matters anew. So let's not stop here or now. Let's persist. Let's fight. Let's make it happen. I believe we can, and I believe we should because the future depends on it. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The internet has never been more important to the world around us and our everyday lives. As COVID-19 forced many businesses to shut down, companies, organizations, and governments quickly moved to get their operations online and to keep our economy afloat. Social distancing measures have forced Americans to rely on broadband to work from home engage in distance learning, access telehealth treatments, and participate in our democracy. Meanwhile, public safety communication resources have been critical to our responses to this year's natural disasters, from hurricanes in the Southeast to superstorms in the Midwest to massive forest fires in California and the Pacific no Northwest. These events show that the case for ensuring that all Americans have high quality, affordable, and reliable broadband service has never been clearer. Five years ago, the Open Internet Order anticipated these challenges by taking a common sense approach towards ISP regulation that encouraged deployment, but also affirmed the FCC's authority to protect competition, public safety, privacy, and consumer rights. A year later, the DC Circuit upheld those rules in their entirety. The Restoring Internet Freedom Order undid that progress based on a belief that broadband providers would provide and prioritize consumers over their own monetary interests. And so nearly three years later, 
What do we have to show for this dramatic policy shift? According to analysis of U.S. Census data, more than 77 million people in the United States lack a home broadband connection, meaning they have no home internet service at all or rely solely on mobile wireless services. This is particularly the case for our most vulnerable Americans. More than half of low-income households lack a fixed broadband connection, including 30% of Black and Latinx people and 34% of Native Americans. From this alarming baseline, the trends are moving in the wrong direction. Wired home broadband adoption rates are slowing, with an increasing number of households accessing the internet again via their mobile devices. This is particularly, I repeat, concerning for vulnerable communities. Low-income households are nearly four times more likely to be mobile only than the wealthiest of households. More Americans than ever are struggling, and it should be our mission to ensure that the lack of connectivity isn't adding to their burdens. According to one recent study of nearly 300 broadband plans in 28 cities across the world, the United States has the highest average monthly prices for home broadband, and those costs add up for real families. And as the economic consequences of COVID-19 hit home, a lot of Americans are worried about how they're going to pay their bills. According to an April 2020 Pew survey, nearly one-third of consumers reported concerned about how they were going to pay their home broadband and wireless bills, with over half, half of low-income households reporting these worries. And according to another recent survey, 30% of Black, Latinx, and other non-white households earning less than $50,000 a year have missed at least one payment on their internet bill since the pandemic began. Almost half of lower income people of color are worried about paying for their home broadband connections moving forward. These are troubling signs regarding the current state of broadband in America. And the majority has dismissed these arguments about net neutrality with attacks on Twitter, straw men, jokes about continued ability to stream cat videos. But the primary argument rests on the idea that the open internet order somehow strangled investment that was restored by the RIF order. As evidence uh, of the benefits of deregulation, they've pointed out how well our networks have performed under historic loads due to COVID-19 social distancing measures, particularly in comparison to Europe. And so let me be clear. I value and deeply appreciate the work American communications providers have done to respond to COVID-19. I'm proud of how our networks appear to have performed under historically high loads of traffic. But any successes are not necessarily due to the RIF order. They just aren't. Increases in download speeds or capital investment instead reflect long-term trends that predate the RIF order and, if anything, were higher under the open internet order's regulatory regime. So let's be real. While capital investment decisions may not take place in a regulatory vacuum, they are based on multi-year business plans, anticipated market conditions, technological cycles. They don't turn on a dime with the FCC's actions. But more importantly, I'm not focused on these old arguments. We're in the middle of a worldwide health crisis in which the internet has proven essential to keeping our economy running and our citizens connected. I'm focused on the fact that the RIF order has, I believe, abandoned regulatory oversight of ISPs and left consumers to corporations with a fiduciary duty to maximize their profits. And while I'm glad that many ISPs pledged not to disconnect customers during the initial months of the pandemic, the RIF order has removed any FCC authority to enforce this voluntary commitment. Moreover, the pledge ended some five months ago, even as our country continues to face historic levels of unemployment and economic distress. But the FCC has no authority to prevent providers from disconnecting customers who can't pay their bills. And there are many battles that we're facing. As I mentioned, epic fires, in the western part of the United States, repeated hurricanes, unprecedented storms. And throughout the country, first responders and other public safety personnel are relying on communications technology to protect us all. Yet through its elimination of Title II authority, the RIF order has left the commission again without the ability to compel ISPs to share their network performance data, let alone impose reliability standards to ensure operations under disaster conditions. The FCC ought to have the leadership in responding to these crises. Regulatory action may not be necessary in all instances, but cheerleading voluntary industry efforts is not my type of leadership. Through the RIF order, we've lost any authority to protect vulnerable consumers and public safety organizations whose broadband connections may be at risk. 
the D.C. Circuit remanded the RIF order because it found insufficient the majority's claim that deregulation will benefit, or at least not harm, public safety, poll attachment access, and the Lifeline program. The remand order claims to address these deficiencies, but in reality, it still falls well short. So let's begin with public safety. I've already mentioned how the FCC has surrendered its authority to force ISPs to share network performance data. And while I'm glad that ISPs report that their networks have performed well, we shouldn't have to take their word for it. In fact, some reports suggest that network performance has not been perfect for all Americans. The FCC should be able to confirm ISPs claims through independent analysis of performance data so that we can identify issues and take regulatory action if necessary. In fact, that sounds pretty core to a well-functioning regulatory agency in my mind. When an ISP harms public safety communications, we're not talking about those streaming cat videos. Someone could get a busy signal when she calls 911 or firefighters may be unable to communicate with each other in the middle of a forest fire. As the DC circuit observed, when public safety is involved, lives are at stake. Unlike most harms to edge providers incurred because of discriminatory practices by broadband providers, the harms from blocking and throttling during public safety emergency are irreparable. People could be injured or die. The remand order excuses our loss of authority here to prevent ISPs from engaging in throttling, blocking, and otherwise harming public safety communications because of the purported severe consequences that an ISP would suffer from any misconduct. For example, the remand order claims that ISPs could experience severe reputational harm, be subject to consumer protection enforcement by the FTC or state agencies for deceptive practices, even be sued by the Justice, of Department, the Justice Department for antitrust violations. But none of those situations address the DC Circuit's concerns about the effectiveness of such an after-the-fact remedy in the public safety context. The remand order also claims the potential loss of life or other harms to public safety are outweighed by the benefits resulting from the RIF order's deregulatory approach. But the remand order fails to provide any specific evidence supporting these claims. In my mind, this is strike one. There are similar issues with the remand order's approach to poll attachments. At first glance, this issue may seem like one only a telecom lawyer could love. But ISPs have struggled to build out their networks without attaching equipment to utility poles. While cable and telecom providers remain protected under the RIF order, the decision to leave broadband-only ISPs with no FCC recourse places them at a huge disadvantage against incumbent providers. The remand order acknowledges that access to these poles is a competitive bottleneck, observes that cable operators, wireless internet service providers, and others have filled the record replete with stories about the difficulties in obtaining reasonable access to polls. Nevertheless, the remand order finds that reclassification does not significantly limit new entrants to the marketplace. And in an exercise in circular reasoning, simply restates the RIF order's claim that most ISPs will remain entitled to FCC protection because their broadband service will come bundled with Title II or cable services. For those ISPs who prefer to adhere to their own business plan and don't want to incur substantial expense of providing telecom or video services, the remand order directs them to their state regulatory authorities. Notes that several states have preempted the FCC Section 224 Poll Attachment Authority or have statutes regulating poll attachment rates charged to ISPs. And of course, if the ISPs can't get state law changed, the RIF order finds that it would be counterproductive to upend our light touch regulatory framework. Again, I fail to see how such a response can satisfy the DC circuit. Strike two. The final issue remanded to the court is the effect of the RIF order on the commission's lifeline program. Nearly 8 million vulnerable Americans rely on this vital program to stay in touch with their families, employers, healthcare providers. When the commission added broadband to the lifeline program in 2016, we clearly based that determination on broadband status as a telecom service under Title II. And as the DC Circuit found, the RIF order ignored the impact of reclassification on the Lifeline program, effectively eliminating the agency's authority to offer Lifeline support for broadband. And in response, the majority engages in strained legal reading to find that a provider may continue to receive Lifeline support for broadband service as long as that provider remains an eligible ETC offering telecom service to some customers. 
this would be tricky on its own terms, but voice service in the Lifeline program will be phased out next year as we sit here. What will happen to those Lifeline providers who may not have any remaining voice customers after the phase out? This is perilous to the millions of vulnerable Americans who depend on the program. The remand order ultimately concludes that even if its legal reasoning falls short, the benefits of reclassification, again, outweigh the removal of broadband internet access from the Lifeline program. Given that the remand order acknowledges those benefits that remain in dispute, I think this statement is chilling. The majority would rather disconnect nearly 8 million Americans from a critically needed service during a pandemic than subject ISPs to any form of FCC oversight. The millions, millions of Lifeline subscribers who depend on this essential program deserve better. Strike three. In closing, the fight for net, new, for net neutrality on the issues raised in this remand issues and others isn't over. We're a week away from a historic election. Its result may dictate whether we affirm the deregulatory path adopted by the majority or take a different course. The House, of course, has already passed the Save the Internet Act, which would restore the open Internet's protections. The stakes are too high to wait. We should take stock of the lessons we've learned since adoption of the open Internet order, adopt new rules that are forward looking, reaffirm the basic principle of consumer choice reflected in the 2005 Internet policy statement. That means building on the consensus that blocking and throttling should be prohibited. It means protecting competition by banning paid prioritization, and it means providing more specific guidance regarding our transparency rules so consumers don't have to scroll through pages of lawyer speak to make their own informed choices. As we vote on this item, I am also struck by the majority's inconsistency in affirming the RIF order, even as the chairman has announced his plan to circulate a rulemaking on Section 230. After all, it was in the RIF order that the majority pointed to Section 230 as evidence of Congress's intent that broadband should re receive a free market approach as an information service. It is absurdly ironic that net neutrality's strongest opponents now argue that the commission should interpret Section 230 to control the speech of private companies. Those pieces don't fit together. And you can't pretend to have a light touch regulatory framework when you're proposing to regulate online content with a heavy hand. This ideological about face shows that the imminent Section 230 rulemaking, I think, is about pleasing the president rather than making good policy. I dissent. Thank you, Commissioner. Almost three years ago, the Federal Communications Commission adopted the Restoring Internet Freedom Order. At that meeting on December 14, 2017, we were forced to take an unanticipated recess because of a bomb threat. And that wasn't the only threat of violence that we had to deal with. Those of us who supported that order received death threats. For good measure, so did my children. Our personal information was leaked all over the internet. We were harassed at our homes. Our relatives were harangued at three in the morning with expletives and profane voicemails. In my case, plenty of nasty racist invective came my way. And my personal email account was hacked. To say the least, it wasn't an easy time. All of this happened because opponents of the Restoring Internet Freedom Order waged one of the most dishonest scare campaigns ever seen. Bernie Sanders warned, this is the end of the internet as we know it. CNN dutifully echoed the comrade's message with a headline, end of the internet as we know it on the front page of its website. The Senate Democrat caucus promised you will get the internet one word at a time. The ACLU ominously predicted that before we know it, a flood will have washed away the free and open internet we all rely on. Planned Parenthood asserted that our decision would temper, if not terminate, the quote, ability of Planned Parenthood patients to access care, including filling out birth control prescriptions and making appointments online, unquote. A Silicon Valley congressman posted the easily debunked proposition that our internet economy would look like Portugal's, which, inconveniently for him, had already adopted utility-style internet regulations. A Minnesota congressman, now the attorney general of that state, said that our decision imperiled racial justice. One self-described award-winning business columnist claimed, your internet bill is about to soar. 
And good faith experts on the nuances of telecom regulation from places like Hollywood, the tech press, Washington lobbyist groups, and Twitter told the American people that they would have to pay extra to access certain websites, that they would have to pay a fee each time they posted on social media, that they would be blocked from accessing their favorite websites, and more, much, much more. Fortunately, the fibs, the fables, and the farrago of fabrications didn't carry the day. Instead, Commissioner O'Reilly, Commissioner Carr, and I focus on the facts and the law, and we did the right thing. Our decision has been increasingly vindicated over time. The internet economy in the United States is stronger than ever. For example, since we adopted the Restoring Internet Freedom Order, average fixed broadband download speeds in the United States have more than doubled, according to UCLA. So much for getting the internet one word at a time. In 2018, we set an annual record for fiber deployment in the United States. And then we broke that record in 2019. In 2018 and 2019, we added over 72,000 new wireless cell sites in the United States, 10 times more than the deployments from 2013, 2014, 2015, and 2016 combined. From 2015 to 2020, real prices for broadband access de decreased by about a third. Our infrastructure has been strong enough to withstand the big increase and the time and geographically shifted usage patterns caused by the pandemic. Indeed, as we've heard, our broadband speeds have gone up, not down, during the pandemic. And we haven't had to go hat in hand to Netflix, YouTube, and other internet content companies and beg them to slow down or even throttle traffic, which is exactly what Europe, which has embraced utility-style regulation of the internet, has had to do. European customers have made clear how they feel about paying for HD video and instead getting SD. It isn't pretty. And most of all, the internet has remained free and open. The American people can still access their favorite websites. They don't have to pay extra to avoid the slow lane. And they don't have to pay a fee each time they tweet. Now, to be sure, a newspaper founded by Alexander Hamilton over 200 years ago, the New York Post, has now been blocked from tweeting. But that's because of the unilateral decision of a tech company that ironically supported so-called net neutrality. And so now, no progressive politician or regulator will mention it, much less criticize it. I'm confused. Whatever happened to the importance of people being able to go where they want and do what they want on the internet? So much for a principled stand for an open internet. Today, it is patently obvious to all but the most devoted members of the net neutrality cult that the case against the restoring internet freedom order was a sham. And that is why things have been so different as we approach this vote than they were back in 2017. Just do a Twitter search on the subject if they allow you to access your account and don't charge you a fee for searching. People are questioning why they were sold a bill of goods. Opponents of the Restoring Internet Freedom Order, who promise you even today that the sky is about to fall, have lost their credibility. The market for shameless demagoguery has dried up. The ruckus is over. Now, none of this, of course, should be a surprise. After all, the free and open internet developed and flourished under a light-touch regulatory framework that started in the Clinton administration and served us well for almost two decades, including the first six years of the Obama administration. So when we returned to that framework in 2017 and abandoned the prior FCC's misguided 2015 decision to subject the internet to heavy-handed regulation under rules designed for the Ma Bell telephone monopoly in the 1930s, there was no reason for any reasonable person, knowledgeable person acting in good faith to think that the parade of horribles promised by opponents would come to pass. Nor should there have been much doubt about the legal soundness of our decision. Last year, the US Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit upheld the key decisions that we made in the Restoring Internet Freedom Order. It upheld our decision to reclassify broadband internet access service as an information service regulated under Title I of the Communications Act, instead of title, the telecommunications service regulated under Title II. It affirmed our decision to eliminate the conduct rules adopted by the prior commission in 2015. And it affirmed our enhanced transparency rule, which ensures that internet service providers disclose to consumers and innovators alike their network management practices. 
the D.C. Circuit did ask us to consider three narrow issues on remand, namely any effects the restoring Internet freedom order might have on public safety, full attachment regulation and the lifeline program. And in today's decision, we consider these three issues in depth and counsel and conclude that none of them a counsel against reversing the decisions that we made 1048 days ago. First, our decision is consistent with our mission to promote public safety. The FCC has always taken this mission seriously, as demonstrated by our recent actions on issues for, from improving the accuracy of wireless location information transmitted with 911 calls to enhancing the geotargeting of wireless emergency alerts. And there is no evidence that the restoring internet freedom order has harmed public safety. Indeed, by employing a light touch, market-driven approach to regulation, broadband providers are better able to build stronger and more resilient networks that enhance public safety, including through services like Next Generation 911. This year, for example, one might say that the COVID-19 pandemic put our networks in the United States to the ultimate stress test, and our networks passed that test with flying colors. Again, broadband speeds actually increased and we didn't have to slow down or throttle traffic, unlike our European counterparts. Additionally, public safety organizations are not harmed by the restoring internet freedom order for the same reason that consumers aren't harmed. The transparency rules we adopted require disclosure of any blocking, or any throttling, or any affiliate or paid prioritization. And we empowered the Federal Trade Commission, an agency dedicated to consumer protection, to ensure that internet service providers behave consistently with their disclosures. To date, we haven't seen any of these practices in the marketplace with respect to network operators. Tech giants, a separate story. And that, of course, isn't surprising. Broadband providers have strong business incentives to ensure that public safety communications are not negatively impacted, just as they have strong incentives not to implement practices that negatively impact consumers. Second, the Restoring Internet Freedom Order has a neg negligible effect on our authority to regulate full attachments under Section 224 of the Communications Act. And that is because the overwhelming majority of internet service providers commingle telecommunications or cable services with broadband service, minimizing any impact resulting from any loss of Section 224 attachment rights. Indeed, one study estimates that at least 96% of the broadband market is served by companies that either co-mingle telecommunications and or cable services with broadband service. Moreover, the FCC's poll attachment jurisdiction does not extend to 22 states and the District of Columbia, which have reverse preempted us. That is, they've displaced us with their own assertion of regulatory power, as well as our lack of jurisdiction over polls and by municipalities, electric cooperatives, railroads, and the federal or state governments, further lessening any impact. Therefore, we conclude that the positive impact on broadband deployment from the light touch regulatory approach taken in the restoring Internet freedom order far outweighs any minimal negative impact on deployment that could result from the minimal change to our authority to regulate pull attachments under Section 224. And most broadband only providers themselves agree with that view. Third, the Restoring Internet Freedom Order does not undermine our statutory authority to include broadband in the Lifeline program. We have ample authority under Section 254E to provide Lifeline support for broadband services furnished by eligible telecommunications carriers, or ETCs. Indeed, it is worth noting that broadband internet access service was classified as a Title I information service, not a Title II telecommunications service when the FCC first used the Lifeline program in 2012 to fund broadband service when we launched the Lifeline broadband pilot program. Under the Communications Act, it is the common carrier status of the provider, not the service, that governs whether the provider is eligible to receive Lifeline support for provide services provided over its network. Thus, if a common carrier offers voice service and qualifies as an ETC, the Lifeline program can support affordable broadband internet access service. For all of these reasons, we stand by and reaffirm the decision that we made in December of 2017, a decision that the passage of time has proven correct. Because of the restoring internet freedom order, more Americans have access to broadband. Broadband networks are stronger and faster than ever. And the internet is free and open. And so, to paraphrase the Margaret Thatcher, no stranger to making tough decisions, now is not the time 
returning. I want to extend my gratitude to the staff who worked on this proceeding. Pam Arlick, Anik Bunun, Adam Copeland, Justin Falb, Janice Gorin, Jody Griffin, Trent Harkrader, Heather Hendrickson, Dan Kahn, Melissa Kirkle, Chris Monteith, Ryan Palmer, Nick Page, and Mike Ray of the Wireline Competition Bureau, Ken Burley, um, um, Burnley, sorry, Emily Kaditz, Justin Kane, Ken Carlberg, Christina Clearwater, Michael Conley, John Evanoff, Lisa Folks, David Firth, Ryan Hedgepeth, Jen Holtz, Deb Jordan, Dave Munson, Erica Olson, Austin Randezzo, Avery Roselle, Chris Meek, and Michael Wilhelm of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, Octavian Carrare, Dick Kwiatkowski, Eric Ralph, Emily Talaga, and Shane uh, Taylor of the Office of Economics and Analytics, and Marlena Barsley, Ashley Boisel, Mike Carlson, Tom Johnson, Marcus Mayer, Rick Mellon, Linda Oliver, and Bill Richardson of the Office of General Counsel. Appreciate all the hard work, folks. Uh, with that, we'll proceed to vote on the item. Commissioner O'Reilly. Uh, Commissioner. Aye. Oh, go. Uh, Commissioner Carr. Approve. Uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel. Dissent. Commissioner Starts. Dissent. The chair votes to approve. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Uh, thank you again to our WCB presenters today. Uh, Madam Secretary, can you please say take us to item number two on the agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the next item will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau and the Office of Excellence and Analytics. And it is entitled Establishing a 5G Fund for Rural America. Chris Monteith, Chief of the Wireline Competition Bureau, will give the introduction. It's not a commission meeting unless Ms. Monteith presents twice. So, Kimo, uh, we turn to you once again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Wireline Competition Bureau, the Office of Economics and Analytics, and the Rural Broadband Auctions Task Force prevent, present for your consideration a report and order that, if adopted, would support the build out of 5G mobile broadband networks in areas that likely would otherwise go unserved so that Americans in rural communities gain access to communication services on par with those offered in urban areas. I will now turn it over to Julia McHenry, Chief of the Office of Economics and Analytics. Julia. button. Thank you, Chris. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, I would like to thank the staff of the task force, the auctions division, and other staff of the Office of Economics and Analytics for their tremendous work on this item. My thanks also to the wireline competition, wireless telecommunications, consumer and governmental affairs, and enforcement bureaus, as well as the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, Engineering and Technology, and the General Counsel for their helpful input. Valerie Barish, attorney advisor in the Office of Economics and Analytics, will now present the item. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. This report and order, if adopted, would establish the 5G Fund for Rural America as a replacement for Mobility Fund Phase 2, directing universal service funds to support the deployment of 5G service in rural areas to make certain that the Commission's limited Universal Service Fund dollars are used to support deployment of state-of-the-art wireless networks that are more responsive, more secure, and faster than today's 4G LTE networks, and would further secure our nation's leadership in 5G. The report and order would adopt the Option B approach proposed in the 5G Fund Notice of Proposed Rulemaking and award 5G Fund Phase 1 support based on new, more precise, verified mobile coverage data collected through the Commission's Digital Opportunity Data Collection and would award support based upon where new mobile coverage data submitted in the Digital Opportunity Data Collection show a lack of unsubsidized 4G LTE and 5G broadband service. The report and order would largely adopt the basic framework for the 5G fund as proposed in the 5G fund notice of proposed rulemaking. First, it would adopt a total budget 
of $9 billion for the 5G fund, which would be awarded in two phases using multi-round descending clock auctions with a 10-year term of support for each phase of the 5G fund with up to $8 billion in phase one with $680 million reserved for service to tribal lands. It would award at least $1 billion plus any unawarded funds from phase one in phase two to specifically target deployment of technologically innovative 5G networks that facilitate precision agriculture. Second, it would adopt the use of an adjustment factor for bidding in the 5G fund auction and disaggregating legacy mobile high cost support that would assign a weight to each geographic area that reflects the relative cost of serving areas with differing terrain characteristics, as well as the potential business case for each area. Third, it would avoid overbuilding by allowing T-Mobile to identify areas that it will commit to deploying as part of enforceable deployment commitments made to the commission as part of the T-Mobile Sprint transaction. Finally, it would adopt broadband specific public interest obligations and performance requirements for legacy high cost support recipients that would require them to use an increasing percentage of legacy support to deploy 5G services starting next year and meet specific service deployment milestones subsequently adopted by the Office of Economics and Analytics and the Wireline Competition Bureau. The Wireline Competition Bureau, Office of Economics and Analytics, and Rural Broadband Auctions Task Force recommend adoption of this report and order and request editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have an official statement, but I'll make a couple of points and move on. I appreciate this item agrees to file the improved maps before extending funding. That's the law. Uh, I suspect that this item likely will change over the next few years. It probably can be improved in a number of areas, and I hope that occurs. I thank the chair for the time. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Carr. Thanks. Over the last few years in this job, I've had the privilege of meeting a whole bunch of Americans where they live, from the packed streets of Philly's Sharswood neighborhood to the dusty dirt roads outside of Arcadia, Indiana. There have been some interesting conversations around kitchen tables, in firehouses, and even on top of water towers. And in all of those diverse conversations, do you know what I have never been asked? When will my family get DOCSIS 4.0? Why don't we have multi-strand fiber to my neighborhood node? Not even, and this one is particularly wounding and personal to me, how is my local small cells 5G NR coming along? People don't even talk generally about broadband. They talk about fast internet. I haven't heard any of those questions. Instead, what I've heard a lot about is this. When will we get fast internet? My family, my business, we need fast internet. Please help. We have helped, and it's one of the great honors of being at the FCC. Partnering with the private sector, we've made it easier to build broadband networks. We've brought to market more spectrum than ever before. We've fostered a 5G workforce through training, education, and awareness. And this approach has given providers the confidence to invest their resources in infrastructure and services to bridge the digital divide. Preferring that technology lead and the private sector fund fast internet has required us to be nimble. As for the technology, the commission has focused on results. I've spliced fiber with workers who connected a record-breaking 6.5 million homes last year. 
I've climbed grain elevators with wisps that will beam high speed service from any structure tall enough to see their customers miles away. I've been up a few towers because 5G can provide competitive in-home access too. In fact, as of last week, all three of our national wireless providers have turned on their broadest coverage 5G and have in-home offerings delivered over wireless. And the newest tech in space, low earth orbit satellites, promise to reach nearly every home in our country with speeds and latency that previously only silly city dwellers had access to. With this record of results, leveraging a vast variety of technologies, it is now more important than ever that we be careful with how we spend Americans' money on broadband, to be good stewards, to treat ratepayers' dollars as our own. We need to focus on what the people we serve actually care about, fast internet by whatever means. And we need to stretch support dollars by ensuring that the government doesn't compete against private sector infrastructure investments. This is a good problem to have. If we're concerned about overbuilding, it means the private sector on its own has stepped up to connect hard to serve communities. If we're worried about our previously siloed support programs overlapping, it's a sign that providers are converging, that technologies are advancing and competing against each other to serve communities. Convergence gives us new routes to the same destination, fast internet. With this backdrop, the item we adopt today moves in the right direction. For a start, it builds off other successful programs since providers can use existing support to build fixed networks that support 5G. For example, a provider that receives RDOF funding to build out a network could use their previous investment to submit a lower bid in the 5G fund auction. And this item seeks better data so we can target support where it's needed most, mindful of the large and growing investment that the private sector is making on its own. As we go forward in this proceeding and with our support programs more generally, we should do so mindful of the increasingly competitive and converged market for connectivity, one where a range of technologies are competing to bridge that last mile in rural America. I wanna thank the Rural Broadband Auctions Task Force, Wireline Competition Bureau, the Wireless Bureau, and OEA for their hard work on this item. It has my support, thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. A year ago, I had the privilege of crisscrossing the roads of West Virginia with Senator Joe Manchin. Although the leaves were at their seasonal peak, we weren't there to take in the views. We were there to talk to residents of the Mountain State about what it's like to live in places without broadband and in places where wireless signals are scarce. These are not communities with 5G. These are communities with no G. But if you look at the maps we have at the Federal Communications Commission, you might be surprised. More often than not, in West Virginia and elsewhere, they don't get it right. They suggest wireless service is available when it's not. They say signals are strong when the lived experience of those who reside there will very clearly and very quickly tell you otherwise. The truth is that this agency has known for years that its maps need serious attention, but unfortunately, we have little to show for it. This is especially true when it comes to wireless service. In fact, the situation is so bad that Senator Manchin himself filed to protest the state of our maps in our last go around to determine where to send support to extend the reach of wireless service to rural communities, which was known as Mobility Fund 2. He wasn't alone. Lots of other challengers filed similar protests pointing out how we got it wrong. In fact, together they filed so much material about errors in our data that this year the agency threw in the towel on Mobility Fund 2 and started anew, which brings us to the new 5G fund before us. Let's start with a positive. The agency saw clearly that without good mapping data, it couldn't have confidence. Its universal service funds for wireless communications would be deployed to the communities that need them most. So today we commit to a new course for wireless universal service support that will ensure we have accurate data and better maps before we commit billions in support. This is the right thing to do. Moreover, it's striking that we insist on maps before money and data before deployment with wireless universal service, because when it comes to wired universal service, 
whose agency has inexplicably run in the other direction. In fact, just days from now, the agency will begin a $16 billion auction for wired services, representing 80% of our funds for the next decade without first seeking accurate data or better maps. In contrast, the course we choose today is both responsible and smart. But here's the not so positive. We're building this auction without grounding it in any real world data. That's because we are still slow rolling efforts to fix our maps. And in fact, we just missed a key deadline under the Broadband Data Act. We can't afford to wait any longer. We need to find some way to make at least some progress now because we need that data to help inform the choices we make about how this auction operates, what speeds it requires, and what build out it compels. We need that data to know what communities lack wireless service and how much reaching them will truly cost. But instead, we're building the ship and setting sail while the compass is still on back order. So many of the choices we make here would benefit from more data and more thinking. For instance, we determined that wireless bidders will have to offer service in 85% of the area that's won at auction. Why not 100%? What facts support anything less than truly universal service? Today, we also determine speed obligations for the next decade, but what study has been done to show that this threshold won't be outdated before the auction even begins? We also set aside funds for precision agriculture projects. What data supports the amount selected? How soon will this effort work in concert with the initial phase of 5G support we commit to today? And what facts actually support that budget? The answers are less than clear because so many of the choices we make here are not grounded in data. So while I support today's decision to commit to a wireless future that is supported by more accurate maps, I think a little more humility would serve us well. The framework we have is sound, but the details would benefit from more data gathering before we proceed. So I think this effort needs some work if we wanna make sure wireless communities and those roads in West Virginia, where I traveled with Senator Manchin and every other place in the United States truly sees the benefit of 5G wireless. For these reasons, I approve in part and dissent in part. One final note, even when I disagree, I appreciate the speed and enthusiasm with which this agency is developing broadband initiatives to improve deployment in rural communities stuck on the wrong side of the digital divide. But I am gobsmacked at our failure to attend to the other half of the digital divide, and that's adoption. Remember, three to four times as many households outside of rural areas have no broadband at home. But we have no new initiatives, no new funding proposals, no new policies to address the millions of children locked out of the virtual classroom. This cruel pandemic has revealed the hard truth that our nation's digital divide is very real and very big. It's time for a greater sense of urgency in every way to fix it. Uh, Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This year, our country has faced unprecedented challenges on so many fronts. The COVID-19 pandemic brought into sharp relief a host of problems that at their core are about fairness issues of racial justice, economic security, and the digital divide, among others. In response to the pandemic, Americans are relying on their wireless devices more than ever for everything from connections to work to school to telehealth applications. They're also using their smartphones, of course, to document injustice and inspiration. Modern wireless technology has served as a powerful tool for building movements that are changing our country and our world. These events should leave no doubt that full participation in civil society requires that internet connection. That's why we must do more to make high quality, affordable broadband, including 5G wireless service available to everyone. Our nation's 5G success will rely on smart policy decisions and industry execution. And I've seen great work that the wireless industry has done through the pandemic. I recently announced the first group of honorees for my digital opportunity equity recognition, the doers that are part of my program, which seeks to acknowledge the efforts of individuals, organizations, and companies seeking to close the digital divide in communities without access to affordable, reliable broadband. Those honorees included several wireless representatives who are working hard to ensure that no one gets left offline during the crisis. They include 
wireless and rural tribal providers like Nishinet in Iowa, Intua Wireless for the Navajo Nation and Triad Wireless in Arizona, as well as Dr. Keisha Taylor, the National Education Administrator for T-Mobile for Education. This is great work, but much more is required to ensure that everyone shares in the benefits of advanced wireless service. According to the Pew Research Center, a disproportionate number of Black and Latinx Americans rely solely on their mobile devices to connect to the internet. Even before 2020, mobile phones were the only way many in these communities could access that online education, the health care, and the employment that they need. 5G must reach these wireless-only households. They share the ubiquitous need to access the most innovative innovative telehealth treatments, participate in sophisticated distance learning from the kitchen table or the city bus, and be as productive working from home as in the office. Every American deserves the opportunity to participate in the 5G revolution, even if they don't live in the wealthiest neighborhoods. We otherwise risk devolving into two Americas, one in which those with much get even more and another that is stuck in the past and falling further and further behind every year. With stakes this high, it is important that we get every last drop out of our universal service dollars. That starts with gathering adequate data that will allow us to really understand the problem. As the Mobility Fund Phase 2 staff report released last year made plain, the widespread skepticism about our current data was justified. Earlier this year, I argued that option A, under which we would target this funding without first developing the new coverage maps Congress ordered us to develop was so flawed and so unsound that it didn't even belong in the NPRM. I'm not surprised then that commenters overwhelmingly rejected that proposal. Making long-term funding decisions based on deeply flawed maps and data would extend and deepen the problems that have interfered with efforts to close the digital divide for too long. And so I agree with the conclusion in today's decision that requiring new mobile coverage data will result in a better understanding of the unserved areas most in need of our limited universal service funds and then existing data. Option B is the right call. So where does that leave us? Before distributing the 5G fund, we do need to gather and analyze new wireless coverage data for the vast majority of the United States. Today's decision tells us to expect that data in 2021 or 2022. Because we are deciding today to make completing that work a precondition to the auction, we should be doing everything in our power to make new maps and data available as quickly as possible. And that's why I'm surprised to be voting on some of the issues addressed in today's item for two reasons. First, it makes me question whether the commission has had its priorities in the right order. Last year, in response to bipartisan frustration with the commission's failure to correct its data, Congress passed the Broadband Data Act. Among other things, that legislation required the commission to adopt final new mapping rules by September 2020 at the latest. We fell short and did not meet that deadline. Given the direct instruction from Congress and the centrality of those rules to the ultimate success of the 5G fund, we should have prioritized them, stayed focused, finished the job. Instead, we find ourselves now in a situation that can only be described as backward. Auction rules we plan to use in two years are before us today, and our past due mapping regulations are not. Second, because we know that under option B, the 5G fund auction is more than just a few months away, many of today's decisions do seem premature. Central in my mind, for example, is the budget. The order explains that the more precise and granular mobile broadband coverage data that will become available in the digital opportunity data collection proceeding will show that the number of areas unserved by unsubsidized 4G LTE will be substantial but it doesn't provide an estimate of how far off the existing data is or an explanation of the assumptions underlying that estimate. And that leaves this order with a paper thin justification for the fund's $9 billion budget. Basically, the order explains the commission took the MF2 phase two budget and doubled it. And the order blows past concerns raised in the record that the budget the commission adopts may not be, uh, or may be insufficient, may not be sufficient pointing out that none of those commenters uh, propose an alternative amount for the 5G fund. But can we blame them? Without new maps, new data, we don't really know uh, how many and what kinds of locations need the money to cover, and neither do our commenters. 
And so without that information, the order's assertion that this budget balances the act's competing objectives, including providing support that's sufficient but not so excessive, it lacks a firm grounding in my mind. And so with respect to phase two, the order recognizes that with the benefit of more time and more information, we may need to adjust this budget, particularly for uh, the budget for tribal lands. And so in my mind, that conclusion also applies to phase one. The concerns are not allayed by the existence of a phase two reserve set aside for some unspecified date in the future. The order promises to dedicate one billion to 5G networks that facilitate precision ag in phase two, as well as many areas left over from the phase one auction. But if the phase one budget is insufficient, still unserved areas will have funding further delayed and be pitted against this unyet specified precision agriculture objective. A more cautious approach would use the time we now have available before the phase two auction to gather facts, give decisions a firm footing. And so for those of us in conclusion that share uh, the commitment to expanding the benefits of 5G to all Americans, this order truly represents an important milestone. It does. And I'm glad that we have decided to distribute the 5G fund using improved maps. But rural Americans deserve more than a $9 billion press release too. We should withhold judgment on issues that would be better decided with new maps and data in hand. And for that reason, I will approve in part and dissent in part. Thank you uh, for the effort by the Bureau. Thank you, Commissioner. This Federal Communications Commission has taken decisive action to cement United States leadership in 5G. We have freed up unprecedented amounts of low, mid, and high band spectrum for commercial use. We've made it easier and less costly to deploy wireless infrastructure. We have encouraged the virtualized infrastructure of the future. We reformed our rules to promote the deployment of fiber, which serves as backhaul for 5G networks. And we've taken critical steps to secure the 5G supply chain. By any metric, our efforts are paying off. 5G networks already cover more than 200 million Americans, and that number is increasing every day. Devices leveraging the power of 5G are in the hands of consumers, as the recent Apple iPhone 12 illustrates. And other countries are following our lead on spectrum policy and supply chain integrity alike. But as we enter the 5G era, we need to make sure that rural Americans aren't left behind. 5G cannot be a technology that only benefits those in urban and suburban areas. That would only broaden rather than narrow the digital divide. Well, fortunately, we've already taken steps to make sure that doesn't happen. One of them is the enforceable commitment we secured from T-Mobile during the T-Mobile Sprint merger proceeding to cover at least 90% of rural Americans with its 5G network within six years. But now we need to build on that momentum and make sure we bring the benefits of 5G to all Americans, no matter where they live. And that means that we need to recognize that there are some sparsely populated areas of our country where the business case for building out 5G networks simply won't exist with private capital alone. That's why I first proposed last December that we establish a 5G fund for rural America. Instead of looking backwards and connecting rural communities with 4G LTE, we should look to the future and ensure that rural Americans have 5G on an equal footing with their urban counterparts. These networks will bring rural Americans the benefits like increased access to healthcare, education, and precision agriculture that are promised by the improved speed, latency, and security of 5G. So today, less than a year after I proposed it, we're establishing the 5G fund for rural America. This will be a two-phase reverse auction that will distribute up to $9 billion to support deployment of 5G networks in rural America. Phase one will use up to $8 billion to target nationwide support for rural areas lacking unsubsidized 4G LTE and 5G broadband service, including $680 million specifically set aside to support deployment on tribal lands. Phase two will provide at least an additional $1 billion in support to focus on the deployment of innovative 5G networks that facilitate precision agriculture. Now, one important point, today we adopt what we call option B in our notice of proposed rulemaking. That means that we will hold the phase one option after we develop precise granular broadband maps through our digital opportunity data collection proceeding, and that we will use those maps to help determine the eligibility for the phase one option. That's assuming, of course, that Congress someday provides us necessary funding, 
which, as I told the House of Representatives a month or so ago, they have not yet done, despite well over a year of requests for it. Now, to be sure, option B doesn't provide the fastest path possible to the phase one option. But this measured approach enjoyed broad support in the record and will ensure that we are targeting funding to the areas that need the support the most, allowing us to make the best use of the scarce dollars in the 5G fund. Now, even though we won't immediately conduct the 5G fund phase one auction, it's important that we establish those rules today. First, they provide certainty for stakeholders and provide a clear path to the 5G fund phase one auction. Second, we adopt broadband public interest obligations that will require carriers currently receiving frozen legacy support to begin spending that support to deploy 5G capable networks in their service areas beginning next year. And this means that we will make better use of universal service funding even before the phase one auction takes place and will expedite 5G deployment in rural areas. Third, the step we are taking today allows our expert staff to complete their work developing an adjustment factor that will be critical to ensuring that hard to serve areas with rougher terrain and more challenging economics will be able to compete fairly for support in the auction. And fourth, we can finally close the door on the 4G focused mobility fund phase two and commit to fully closing the mobile digital divide through the 5G fund. I would like to thank the many staff that worked on this item from the Office of Economics and Analytics the Rural Broadband's, Broadband Auctions Task Force, the Office of Engineering and Technology, the Wireline Competition Bureau, the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, the Office of Native Affairs and Policy, and the Office of General Counsel for the hard work on this item. It has my full support. Uh, with that, we'll move to a vote on the item. Commissioner O'Reilly? Aye. Commissioner uh, Carr? Approve. Commissioner Rosenworcel? Approve in part, dissent in part. Commissioner Starks? Approve in part, dissent in part. Uh, the chair votes to approve. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Uh, thank you to the presenters for uh, and everybody for the hard work on the item. Uh, Madam Secretary, can you take us to item number three on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the third item on your agenda will be presented by the Office of Engineering and Technology and is entitled Increasing Unlicensed Wireless Opportunities in TV White Spaces. Ron Rapazzi, Acting Chief of the Office, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, Mr. Rapazzi, if you're there, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. We're pleased to present for your consideration a report and order and further notice of proposed rulemaking that would expand opportunities for unlicensed white space devices in unused portions of the broadcast television bands. Since we first adopted white space devices rules in 2008, they have become an important option for providing broadband services, especially in rural and unserved areas of the country. The report and order modifies our rules to enhance the ability of white space devices to deliver broadband services to these areas and provide opportunities for new and innovative Internet of Things applications. The further notice of proposed rulemaking explores possible changes to the model for identifying unused spectrum for white space devices. Hugh Ventile, senior engineer in our policy and rules division will present the item. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and commissioners. The item before you is a report in order and further notice of proposed rulemaking that expands opportunities for unlicensed white space devices operating in broadcast television bands. White space devices are used to provide affordable broadband service to rural and underserved areas and can also provide greater connectivity for Internet of Things devices. This item continues our ongoing efforts to spur growth of the white space device ecosystem so that the benefits of broadband communications can be enjoyed by all Americans while protecting broadcast television stations and other licensed services from harmful interference. This portion of the radio spectrum has excellent propagation characteristics that make it particularly attractive for delivering communication services over long distances. Fixed white space, space devices are being deployed today by wireless internet service providers or WISPs to provide internet connectivity to rural and underserved areas, including schools, libraries, and individual households. 
The report in order increases the maximum power and antenna height for fixed white space devices, which will enable WISP to provide broadband coverage at greater distances and lower cost. We continue to protect authorized services and protected entities from harmful interference by requiring correspondingly larger separation distances for these white space devices. The report in order also allows higher power mobile operations within defined geofenced areas. The geolocation capability required for mobile white space devices, working in conjunction with the white space database, will ensure that these devices do not cause harmful interference to authorized services and protected entities in the TV bands. The report in order also adopts rules for narrowband white space devices that can be used in new and innovative Internet of Things applications. The further notice of proposed rulemaking explores whether we should modify the rules to permit the use of terrain based models such as the Longley Rice Irregular Terrain Model for determining available TV channels for white space devices, which could make additional spectrum available for these devices. The staff recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges solely for technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Uh, thank you and Mr. Repositor for that presentation. We'll now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Making television white spaces available for wireless services without disrupting the great work of America's broadcasters has been a project of mine since well before I came to the commission. It's been a pleasure to lead the charge on this effort, even if faced some reluctance, both externally and internally, which thankfully appears to have dissipated. Utilizing the gaps between TV stations provides a unique opportunity to expand wireless broadband services to those Americans without access to them. For most, it provides access to frequencies in rural America where there are fewer broadcasters assisting our efforts to serve the unserved, especially with new broadband offerings, and to use spectrum as efficiently as possible. Everyone should celebrate the recently demonstrated benefits of white space usage, particularly those by Microsoft's Airband Initiative. Today's action, which incorporates a collaborative agreement between Microsoft and Americans broadcasters, will allow greater use of TV white spaces by increasing power limits in less congested areas and permitting higher antenna heights for fixed wireless equipment, allowing higher power for mobile operations within defined areas and adopting rules for narrowband IoT operations. These rule changes, along with some other technical tweaks, will enable the provision of a wider variety of wireless services to Americans over a larger geographic area while not harming incumbent broadcast service. Although these are great developments, there are still some areas that need to be considered further. I thank my colleagues for agreeing to pursue terrain modeling and seek comment on its possible implementation. I also appreciate my colleagues agreed to changes clarifying certain rules affecting the use of narrowband IoT devices. While I will not be at the commission to, per, to push and resolve remaining last few issues, I'm encouraged that my colleagues agreed to explore them. I look forward to following the developments of TV White Space's broadband offerings and seeing what other innovative services grow out of this proceeding. I will approve, and I thank the chair. Thank you, Commissioner O'Reilly. Commissioner Card. Thanks. Blue Mountain is a ridge line that rises about a thousand feet above the farms in small towns that are spread across Pennsylvania's Cumberland Valley. Up on top of that ridge, a few miles outside of Carlisle, sits an old AT&T long line tower. It's a roughly five story concrete structure first built in the 1940s. But it was cutting edge back in the day, part of the then high tech network of microwave towers that connected the east and west coasts of the country. Today, a fixed wireless provider, CTI Networks, is putting this old infrastructure to a new use. Like many WISPs, CTI is a small and scrappy company. I met its owner, Alan, at the tower last week, and from up on top, he pointed out all the farms and homes in the valley below that had been stuck with only slow DSL for far too long. That's now changing. Allen has attached a couple of small antennas to the tower that are now beaming high-speed wireless service to these underserved communities. I've seen essentially the same story play out in rural areas throughout the country, where WISPs are working tirelessly to provide life-changing internet service to communities that have been left behind. 
Stories like these are precisely why today's item is such a big win for consumers in these hard-to-reach communities. Fixed wireless will continue to play an important role in the FCC's effort to increase connectivity, and it's critical that we expand opportunities for white space devices, particularly in rural America, as we do here today. We can make even more progress towards closing the digital divide while empowering rural communities through high-speed connections. A big reason we're here today, of course, is because stakeholders got together, they compromised, and identified a path forward. This item is a testament to their efforts, and I'm hopeful their action today will help accelerate fixed wireless builds in even more rural communities that are still on the wrong side of the digital divide. I want to thank the Office of Engineering and Technology for their work on this item. It has my support. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. The years 2008 and 2020 have a few things in common. Both feature a major election. Both have Tampa Bay playing in the World Series. And a bit further below the campaign and cultural radar, in both years, we have decisions that are monumental for white spaces. It was in 2008 that the FCC first decided to open up unused broadcast spectrum for unlicensed services. Instead of letting portions of traditional television airwaves lay fallow, we determined white spaces should be available for innovation. In 2020, we are still enchanted with the opportunities for unlicensed services in these airwaves. We have explored a range of possibilities, including broadband access in underserved communities. But technical challenges have sometimes limited our progress. So today we make another important decision in the history of white spaces, building on the work of a group of interests in this band that came together to hammer out their differences we adopt rules that give devices using white spaces increased flexibility. Specifically, we increase permissible power levels for both fixed and mobile devices and remove existing restrictions on antenna heights on fixed devices in less congested areas. In addition, we revise our rules to authorize new narrowband services and applications. Making these changes is the right move. Today's decision has my support. But here's my wish. Let's not wait another dozen years before making our next meaningful decision on white spaces. We have too much work to do to power the Internet of Things, extend the reach of broadband access, and expand the range of innovation possible in wireless service. So let's get to it. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Millions of Americans live in areas without any form of broadband service. The Commission has a long sought to promote the use of white spaces as a broadband service option for these communities. And so today's decision is a great step towards finally realizing the full potential of this important technology. The rule changes adopted today reflect a common sense agreement between the white space community and broadcasters that will allow for more full, robust service, efficient spectral use, particularly in rural areas without increasing the risk of harmful interference to television broadcasters or other authorized services. With better access to broadband service, rural and tribal communities will be able to strengthen their local economies, receive higher quality telehealth services, successfully participate in distance learning, and securely work from home during this pandemic. I'm particularly pleased about how our new rules will expand the mobile use of white space devices. With the higher power levels authorized today, mobile devices will allow farmers to better manage their crops and livestock through precision agriculture. Additionally, mobile white space devices will be able to operate as a school bus hotspot, allow children in rural areas without broadband at home to complete homework on those long rides to and from school when that day comes. I'm also looking forward to seeing how narrowband IoT devices will take advantage of the propagation characteristics of the low band white space spectrum to enable new innovative uses uh, for mining, agriculture, environmental monitoring sectors. These rule changes uh, will uh, we adopt today will maintain a low risk of harmful interference while expanding opportunities for IoT and rural environments. Finally, I do appreciate that the order reflects changes suggested by me and my colleagues, including seeking further comment on the use of terrain-based models to protect services in the TV bands. While there may still be uh, some questions about how these models would work in the white spaces context, they do deserve 
further consideration because they reflect real world conditions and are used for other bands. And so I look forward to the comments on that. Thank you to uh, the Office of Engineering and Technology for their work on the item. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. My top priority as chairman of the FCC has been closing the digital divide. A critical part of our work on that front has been expanding the deployment of high-speed broadband in rural America. By modernizing our universal service fund programs, reducing unnecessary regulatory burdens, making more spectrum available for commercial use, and reducing the cost of deploying broadband infrastructure. Since January of 2017, we have substantially reduced the number of rural Americans without broadband access. But we still have more work to do. And with broadband now more important than ever as a result of the pandemic, we must use every tool at our disposal to connect unserved Americans. Today, we adopt rules that will expand the availability of wireless broadband connectivity through the use of TV white space devices, one such tool. The TV white space spectrum, which includes unoccupied channels and the broadcast TV bands, has several attributes that make it attractive for delivering wireless broadband service to rural America. The signals propagate well over long distances, over varying terrain, and even into and within buildings. The Commission first authorized unlicensed white space operations in 2008 and has expanded white space operations on uh, several occasions since then, each time taking care not to interfere with broadcast television station operations. For example, in 2019, we modified our antenna height rules to allow for improved broadband coverage in rural areas. Well, today, thanks in no small part to the collaborative work of key industry stakeholders like Microsoft and the National Association of Broadcasters, we now adopt additional changes to the operating and technical rules for white space devices that will expand their ability to deliver wireless service in many rural and underserved areas. We allow fixed white space devices in less congested areas to operate at higher power and increased height above average terrain. We create a new class of geofenced mobile white space devices that can operate at higher power levels. And we reform our rules to allow for the deployment of narrowband IoT white space devices. These rules will permit operation in smaller 100 kilohertz channels at the same maximum power level currently permitted for fixed devices. At the same time, however, we take the critical steps necessary to ensure that these reforms don't end up causing harmful interference to broadcast television stations, which are, after all, the primary users of this band. In short, we ably thread the needle, protecting the ability of broadcast TV stations to serve their communities and helping bring digital opportunity to more rural Americans and close the digital divide. Not bad for a day's work, especially after a dozen years. For all their help on this matter, I'd like to thank the staff from the Office of Engineering and Technology, the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, the Enforcement Bureau, the Office of General Counsel, and the Office of Economics and Analytics. Great work by everybody. And with that, we'll proceed to a vote. Commissioner Riley? Aye. Commissioner Carr? Approve. Commissioner Rosenworcel? Approve. Commissioner Starks? Approve. Uh, the chair votes to approve as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thumbs up to OET. All right. Uh, to item number four we go, Madam Secretary. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the fourth item is entitled Streamlining State and Local Approval of Certain Wireless Structure Modifications. This item will be presented by the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, and Donald Stockdale, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, good to see you, Mr. Stockdale. The floor is yours. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Today, the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau is pleased to present for your consideration a report and order on state and local approvals of wireless equipment modifications under Section 6409A of the Spectrum Act. I want to thank the dedicated Wireless Bureau staff, along with the staff from the Office of General Counsel, Office of Consumer and Governmental Affairs, Office of Economics and Analytics, Enforcement Bureau, Wireline Competition Bureau, and the Office of Communications Business Opportunities for their work on this item. George Laris, a Senior Attorney Advisor in the Competition and Infrastructure Policy Division of the Wireless Bureau, will present the item. George. 
Thank you, Don. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, I am pleased to present this report in order for your consideration today. This item revises parts of the Commission's rules that establish a streamlined process for state and local government review of applications to deploy certain wireless telecommunications equipment on existing infrastructure. The report in order will promote deployment of 5G and other advanced wireless services by facilitating the collocation of antennas and associated ground equipment on existing infrastructure while preserving state and local government's ability to manage and protect local land use interests. Section 6409A of the Spectrum Act of 2012 provides that state and local governments may not deny and shall approve a request to add, remove, or replace wireless transmission equipment on existing infrastructure that does not substantially change the physical dimensions of the existing structure. Under the Commission's 2014 rules implementing Section 6409, a state or local government must approve within 60 days any qualifying request to modify existing wireless infrastructure. This report and order addresses the following issues raised in two petitions requesting clarification of and changes to the Commission's Section 6409 rules. First, it revises the definition of substantial change to provide that the modification of an existing tower outside the public rights of way that entails ground excavation or deployment of up to 30 feet in any direction outside the boundaries of a site will be eligible for streamlined processing pursuant to Section 6409A. This revision is consistent with the July 2020 amendment to the Nationwide Programmatic Agreement for the Collocation of Wireless Antennas which provides that excavation or deployment up to 30 feet beyond a site boundary does not generally warrant federal historic preservation review of a collocation. This revision also recognizes the trend toward collocation of multiple antennas and associated transmission equipment, including ground equipment, at a tower site. Response to the need for more space on the ground to accommodate a growing number of facility modifications and provides flexibility to service providers seeking to deploy additional transmission equipment to support next generation wireless services. Second, the report in order revises the definition of site to provide that the current boundaries of a site are the boundaries that existed as of the date that the original tower or base station or a modification to that structure was last reviewed and approved by a state or local government if the approval of the modification occurred prior to the Spectrum Act or otherwise outside of the Section 6409A process. This revision will ensure that the site boundaries appropriately reflect prior state or local government review and approval. The Wireless Telecommunications Bureau recommends the Commission adopt this item and request editorial privileges to make technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Well, thank you for that presentation, uh, Mr. Stockdale. And Mr. Larson, is this your first uh, presentation at a Commission meeting? I could be wrong. but It is. Ah. Well, in that case, Epkaristopoli uh, is my limited Greek. Yeah, that's the best I could do, but very well done. Uh, Thank we'll you very to, much, Chairman. <laughs> we'll talk, turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. From my earliest days at the Commission, I've met with tower companies, wireless providers, and their trade associations to start an open dialogue about needed improvements to the regulatory structure that is ensnarling infrastructure siting. Unfortunately, in numerous meetings, these entities cited a myriad of legitimate examples of local governments, historic preservation boards, and tribal nations continuously placing unnecessary barriers in the way of Americans receiving higher quality services and the latest wireless innovations. Sometimes there was even a reluctance to share their experiences given the potential for negative blowback, but the stories and details made clear to me that the commission action was needed. Such prohibitions and delays are even more egregious when they affect wireless providers' ability to co-locate on existing towers. Everyone would naturally assume that staunch tower opponents would support efforts to use existing towers instead of building additional ones, which some find unsightly. Yet despite this logical presumption and even congressional action to facilitate co-locations, the wireless industry still faced and continues to face ridiculous hurdles. The list of obstacles were quite extensive early on, and the Commission has tackled many of these issues already. But one of the problems repeatedly highlighted was obtaining approval for the compound expansion needed when a provider wanted to co-locate on a tower, whether it be for equipment cabinets or generators for backup power, 
long approval processes were being required to expand compounds on land already zoned for this very use. It amazes me how some can argue against today's action, repeatedly calling for and sometimes criticizing the need for greater resiliency, expansion of networks, and the deployment of FirstNet's system. Not to mention, most recognize that the deployment of 5G will require more equipment to be placed within these compounds. Although, although today's action could have been done earlier, I am pleased that we are finally eliminating the barriers unjustly restricting compound expansion. After having given many speeches on this topic, I appreciate this item was brought to conclusion before I depart. Well, this particular issue comes to a close, we unfortunately have failed to resolve the infrastructure related issue that has been on the top of my list the longest, Twilight Towers. About 5,000 towers, some of which have been in existence for almost two decades, are available for co-locations. Alas, the commission's plan to resolve these issues arose because the commission's rules were unclear. It's hard to believe that some would hinder network deployment, especially at a time when everyone is relying on telecommunication services to keep in touch with loved ones, attend school, visit their doctors, and do their jobs. There is plenty of leadership blame to go around on this issue, but let's be clear. The ACHP must reverse its nonsensical decision on this matter immediately. I thank the chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carter. Thanks. If you've ever driven out Arlington Boulevard to where it meets DC's Beltway, chances are that your phone has checked in with a wireless tower located on Gallows Road. You might not have noticed it as you drove by because the tower has been made to be about the same height and have the same brown trunk and green branches as the trees that surround it. Loaded on that trunk and hidden between those branches is radio equipment for two wireless providers. And there are discussions about a third provider co-locating soon. At the base of that mono pine are the fiber, computing equipment, and power supply for the wireless providers, and even the local cable company to boot. Think about all the work that that single tower does. For example, it serves the Inova Fairfax Hospital about a mile away. With an urgent buzz of pagers, the tower summons surgeons to the ER to save lives. It delivers texts home that say someone's gonna be okay. It's positioned even closer to two public elementary schools. Before the pandemic, there's no doubt the tower carried communications between teachers and their students' families. Now, one of the schools is an election day center. If a voting machine breaks down, the lines are too long, or there's any other barrier to ensuring that citizens' right to vote is secured on Tuesday, poll workers will rely on that tower to find solutions quickly. The point is we don't realize how much we depend on our local wireless tower until it stops working and we yell at our cell phone company. And even if we do pause for a moment to ponder and appreciate how much wireless is integrated into our daily lives, almost none of us see the discoveries, the planning, the investment, and the regular effort required to keep us connected. One person who is deeply aware of those efforts is Tam Murray. The company he founded, Community Wireless, builds and operates towers in Northern Virginia, including the one on Gallows Road. It's a place where exurbs have grown into suburbs and suburbs have grown into cities in their own right. With that growth have come an increased demand for data, an expectation that people who live in the suburbs, exurbs, and rural communities will enjoy the same reliability that city people enjoy. Tam has been planning to upgrade the Gallows Road Tower to meet his consumers' demands. When I visited the tower with him last week, Tam showed me where he wants to expand his fence to make room for backup power. Trees cover that area and it's notoriously difficult to keep the power on during storms. While a house without power might be a manageable inconvenience for some, a tower without power can cut off wireless service for miles around, and that's unacceptable, especially in an emergency. FirstNet, the government authority charged with building a first responders network, has contracted for new backup power at cell sites across the country. In fact, the California Public Utilities Commission this year mandated 72 hours of backup power at sites statewide. 
Tim also needs some more space to expand capacity. Wireless providers are adding more equipment to tower to light up the massive amount of spectrum this commission has brought to market. 5G's hallmark speed, gigabits through the air, requires a lot of spectrum and often lots of equipment to use each band. And 5G's low latency, network response in milliseconds, can be advanced by computing power located at tower sites. To provide these robust 5G capabilities, TAM's site needs a modest expansion. In 2012, Congress anticipated problems of this sort. Back then, the wireless providers were finishing a massive upgrade to 4G, ushering in the era of mobile broadband. Tower upgrades seemed like no-brainers. They directly benefited communities with fast service while requiring only minor equipment changes to towers that had already been built. Yet many communities were being left behind because of the long delays and high costs that some municipal governments imposed on straightforward tower work. Congress stepped in with Section 6409, which mandated that municipal governments approve tower upgrades that don't substantially change the physical dimensions of the tower. Two years later, the FCC wrote rules implementing 6409. One of our tasks then was to define what would and wouldn't count as a substantial change so that tower owners could have some certainty about which upgrades would qualify for expedited approval. To complete that task, the commission turned to two agreements that we reached with ACHP and the National Conference of State Historic Preservation Officers. Those agreements cover tower replacements and co-locations, which are when equipment is changed on an existing structure. The agreement allow replacements and co-locations to proceed without going through the protracted historic preservation or environmental reviews in some circumstances. We noted that Congress was aware of the agreements when it enacted Section 6409, and Congress explicitly referenced our ongoing historic preservation and environmental obligations within the statute's texts. Because of this, we reasoned that modest tower changes allowed under the agreements would be a good starting point for understanding the tower changes Section 6409 would allow. As a policy matter, it makes sense that updates to towers that are minor enough to exclude from our other reviews may be minor enough to exclude from municipal approvals. And if there's consistency between our environmental, historic, and local approval rules, it would simplify and expedite tower upgrades, exactly the purpose of Section 6409. There was one discrepancy between the agreements, which forms the crux of what we're doing here today. The 2001 agreement, which covers co-locations, didn't allow for any excavation or deployment beyond the limits of a tower site at the time of the co-location. In contrast, the 2005 agreement, which covers tower replacements, allowed a tower site to be expanded up to 30 feet. When the commission wrote its rules for section 6409, it looked at the two agreements that had nearly identical terms, except for site expansion. On that question, the commission picked the older agreement, although without much discussion or reasoning. The discrepancy between the 2001 and 2005 agreements didn't make much sense in the first place. From an environmental and historic preservation perspective, the point of the agreements was to encourage reuse of existing tower sites instead of building duplicative ones. If evolving technology and circumstances by 2005 show that an additional 30 feet were needed to revitalize tower sites and on balance were better for environmental and historic preservation interest in building new sites, then that reasoning would apply with equal force to the 2001 agreement. In July of this year, ACHP, Nick Shippo, and the FCC corrected the discrepancy between those agreements. We jointly amended the 2001 agreement to allow for tire tower site expansion when co-locating, which brought the 2001 agreement into conformance with the 2005 one. And now that leaves us with the commission's 6409 rules as the sole remaining outlier. Today's order finishes our work to sync the site expansion rules between the agreements in section 6409. We will not allow, we will now allow 30 feet of site expansion consistently across our environmental, historic preservation, and local approval rules. From the NPRM to the published draft, and from the draft to today's version, we made a number of changes that we thought 
resolved outstanding issues and were true to the balance Congress struck in Section 6409. Our definition of site reaffirms local zoning authority by marking site boundaries as those last reviewed and approved by a local government outside of the Section 6409 process. Per municipal government's requests, we now emphasize that the equipment to be deployed in the expanded site is specifically transmission equipment. We clarify that the municipal governments retain their usual easement power, and we state that site expansion is to be measured from the current site and not from existing easements. We appreciate municipal governments, industries, and all commenters' assistance in refining our rules over the last few months. The final work product benefited from your contributions. This action marks another significant step in our broader effort to modernize wireless infrastructure rules. Over the last three years, we've set limits on fees and shot clocks for environmental and historic preservation review. We put in place guardrails around municipal government review and fees on small cell technology. We streamlined the process for swapping out utility poles, add wireless equipment. We created an expedited approval process for tower bills during COVID-19. We accelerated next gen network through our 5G upgrade order, and now we pave the way for more resilient and capable sites through this action. Those are, of course, on top of the Commission's bold moves on spectrum and workforce development. America is home to the strongest 5G platform in the world. And at least some of the credit for that accomplishment should go to our Wireless Telecommunications Bureau and its infrastructure team. I'd like to acknowledge the members of that team who had a hand in today's item and so many others that we've approved. Paul Diari, Garnet Hanley, Kerry Hicks, George Laris, Belinda Nixon, Dana Schaefer, Don Stockdale, and Joel Tabenblatt. To the tremendously talented staff, I thank you again for your service to the commission and the country. Your work in this order have my support. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. As telecommunications laws go, Section 6409 of the 2012 Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act is simple and straightforward. It forbids localities from exercising their traditional zoning authority to deny applications to modify wireless towers or base stations if and only if the application does not substantially change the physical dimensions of the existing facility. Congress enacted this law because it made sense to speed up routine approvals for wireless deployments that almost always have no impact on state or local interests. But Congress also took care to bar applications from this process that would result in substantial change to wireless towers. You know, I'm familiar with this section of the law because as congressional staff, I was in the proverbial room where it happened and I helped write it. But being there is hardly necessary the law is clear on its face. It's also clear that the decision we make today is inconsistent with the statute. And if we continue down this road, we risk thwarting the very partnerships with local interests we need if we want to see smart cities technology truly develop. Let me explain. First, you can't square the plain language of Section 6409 with today's decision. It stretches credulity to suggest that excavation or deployment of up to 30 feet outside of the boundaries of a tower compound does not substantially change the physical dimensions of that site. 30 feet is five refrigerators laid out one after the other. It's half the size of a bowling lane. It's about one fifth of the way up the leaning tower of Pisa. You can't tell me that construction of this size does not substantially change the physical dimensions of a site. The Federal Communications Commission used to acknowledge this too. When the agency first interpreted Section 6409 in 2014, it concluded that excavation outside of the current site of a tower was a substantial change. That didn't mean that a wireless provider could not expand an existing site, not at all. It just meant that those applications would be approved in the normal course, subject to regular state and local review. Our rationale for changing direction today doesn't stand up to legal scrutiny. The agency acknowledges that in its decision in 2014, it drew guidance from similar language in the nationwide programmatic agreement or of, the of the collocation of wireless antennas, or better known as the collocation MPA. 
It then relies on the fact that the collocation NPA was amended recently to exclude excavations of up to 30 feet from the definition of substantial change to suggest the FCC can do the same here. But this is comparing apples to oranges. The collocation NPA addresses the review process under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. It says absolutely nothing about Section 6409 of the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act. Whatever changes have been made to the collocation NPA, the FCC cannot expand the scope of Section 6409 without authority from Congress to do so. Second, when we proceed like this, we create genuinely unhelpful friction between state and local interests who have filed en masse in this proceeding to protest how this agency is diminishing their authority. By doing so, we reduce the opportunity to foster the kind of partnerships between providers and state and local authorities that can help build smart cities where connectivity will help improve the quality of life. That can mean everything from adaptive traffic signals to increased energy efficiency, to improved waste management, to more data-driven problem solving in real time. But we won't get there anytime soon if this agency keeps reading the statute in a way that leaves state and local authorities aggrieved that they lack a say in what is being built in their own backyard. We need a way forward that speeds the review of essential facilities and makes cities and states partners and not adversaries in the process. I think we are creative enough to develop one, but this isn't it. I dissent. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It has been well over seven months since COVID-19 first hit the United States, even as more than 225,000 people have died from the pandemic and unemployment has hit record highs. State and local governments have been on the front lines running healthcare systems, schools. They've done so, of course, to despite uh, tight budgets of their own, and they're only going to get more limited. Today's report and order adds to these considerable challenges by requiring these governments to provide streamlined processing to request for ground excavations or deployments of transmission equipment up to 30 feet in any direction outside a macro cell tower site on its face. This decision is inconsistent with the plain language of Section six, uh, 6409, which mandates streamlined processing only for modifications of quote unquote existing wireless towers. By its own terms, the provision does not extend its requirements beyond the wireless tower itself. And yet this decision will allow applicants to obtain streamlined processing for work well outside the facility. Moreover, this decision could encourage applicants to evade local zoning regulations by seeking initial approval for less space than they actually need and then obtaining streamlined processing for expansions beyond that area. Such expansions could lead to serious public safety issues. I also take issue with the report and order's decision to define the current boundaries of the site of a tower based on the most recent review and approval by the state or local government. This definition is too broad. Site should only refer to the area surrounding the tower that was identified as a tower site in the relevant application, the last received discretionary approval from the applicable authority. It should not be based upon non-discretionary approvals lacking any substantive review. And so this definition of site uh, again, could lead to expansions to areas that state or local governments never had the opportunity to consider on the merits. And so, as the country continues to grapple with COVID-19, state and local governments are working overtime to respond to the crisis and continue their daily operations. This decision, I fear, will add yet another problem to their plate. Expansions that may create public safety hazards in communities that they're already working tirelessly to protect. While streamlining rules and flexibility can be helpful and sometimes necessary, we should not do so at the expense of state and local governments that are already overburdened. And so for these reasons, uh, I will dissent. Thank you, Commissioner. I will have a, a longer written statement that I'll submit into the record, but I will simply say for now that I fully support the order for the reasons ably expounded by Commissioner Carr. I want to express my gratitude as well to uh, the staff of the uh, Wireless Telecommunications Bureau and the many other bureaus and offices that contributed to the work on this important item. Uh, with that, we'll proceed to a vote. Commissioner O'Reilly? Aye. Commissioner Rosenworcel? 
Oh, sorry, Commissioner Carr. <laughs> Approve. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Dissent. Commissioner Starks. Dissent. Uh, the chair votes to approve as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks again uh, to the staff for the great work. Uh, Madam Secretary, could you please take us to the next item on today's agenda? Oh, Madam Secretary, I think you might be muted. Sorry. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the fifth item is entitled All Digital AM Broadcasting. Revitalization of the AM radio service. The item will be presented by the Media Bureau and Michelle Carey, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Carey. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Today, the Media Bureau presents a report and order that allows AM radio stations to transition to all digital broadcasting on a voluntary basis. Christine Gepp, from the Bureau's Audio Division will present the item. Sorry, Ms. Gap, I think you're muted. Sorry. In your mm -hmm. Sorry, very sorry about that. Is can you hear me now? Uh, you're, yep, crystal clear. Thanks. Almost Mr. like it's Chairman, a AM signal. <laughs> Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, we're pleased to present this report and order that authorizes AM all digital radio on a voluntary basis. The Commission has long recognized the benefits of digital technology, such as a clearer audio signal over a larger geographic area, greater resistance to environmental noise and the ability to transmit visual information, such as song and artist identification, along with the audio signal. However, due to the technical constraints of the AM band, hybrid analog and digital operation has not been as widely adopted by AM stations as by FM stations. This item addresses that issue by allowing AM broadcasters to cease broadcasting an analog signal and transmit using an all digital signal um, in the HD radio all digital mode. All digital AM testing has demonstrated that the technology provides for a superior listening experience compared to analog AM. One station that has conducted such testing pursuant to special temporary authority, WWFDAM in Frederick, Maryland, went from having no ratings to being a Nielsen ranked station, demonstrating the potential of digital AM to help revive the AM band. Conversion to all digital will be purely voluntary, and we expect that each AM radio station will make the decision based on the state of its respective market, considering factors such as the number of digital receivers in the market and the cost of technical upgrades to its facility. In many cases, this transition will be eased by the fact that listeners will still be able to receive analog programming from the AM station's FM translator or a commonly owned AM station, thus minimizing any disruption in service. We anticipate a gradual rollout as the number of digital receivers, which is currently around 70 million, continues to grow nationwide. This report and order also establishes technical rules um, relating to all digital transmission. These rules include power limitations, authorization of both day and nighttime operation, and participation in the emergency alert system. All digital stations will be provided to require at least one free over-the-air digital programming stream that is comparable to or better in audio quality than a standard analog broadcast. The report and order also requires that all digital stations avoid causing interference to other stations as currently defined in the rules and sets forth procedures to remediate any such interference that occurs. Finally, the report and order requires stations converting to all digital to notify both the Commission and its listeners 30 days prior to any conversion. The Media Bureau recommends that the Commission adopt this report and order and request editorial privileges to make any necessary technical or conforming edits. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. We'll now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No statement for me. Just make a qu couple points real quick. Uh, this item provides a voluntary option for AM broadcasters who face tremendous difficulty 
during this pandemic. I certainly appreciate that we decline to insert a particular standard in our rules has been my complaint in the past and other proceedings. And I really appreciate that we didn't do it here. And so I think so, and we'll support the item. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carr. So to echo Commissioner O'Reilly's uh, points and thanking the team for their hard work on this item, it has my support. Thank you. All right, moving right along, uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel. In a world with so many ways to listen, there's still something special about a signal in the air. Radio and AM radio in particular has long played a role beyond just informing and entertaining. It has created communities and anchored people to place. That capacity for localism is still what makes the medium distinct. It is what gives it the ability to shine when so much other audio content is available. Today's decision provides the AM band a bit more opportunity to glow. That's because in light of the growing interference issues with the band, we offer licensees the opportunity to transition to digital service. In doing so, we let stations decide if all digital is right for them and the listeners they serve. We recognize the right receivers may not be ubiquitous and that moving from analog to digital format may fracture audiences. So we allow licensees to choose the way forward without mandates that impose widespread costs on consumers. This is a prudent approach and it has my support. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Starks. Yes, no statement from me. Uh, thank you so much to the team for their hard work on, uh, on this important initiative. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I'll have a longer statement myself uh, for the record, but for now, let me just say that making this transition to all digital gives a unique opportunity to AM broadcasters who've done such a great job over the year to better reach their listeners. That's uh, better audio quality, better coverage, uh, whether analog or hybrid. And so the decision to convert to all digital has, has been mentioned will be voluntary. Uh, AM broadcasters can decide how best to adapt their service to meet the needs of the listeners and their markets. And we will require AM broadcasters who do this to give the listeners advance notice. So any transition will be consumer friendly. And so in short, what we're doing today is enabling AM broadcasters uh, on the commercial AM radio side, which is a service that turns 100 years old just next week, as a matter of fact, to compete in an increasingly digital media landscape. And hopefully that will presage another century of excellent service for AM radio. Uh, thanks to the Media Bureau, the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, the Office of Economics and Analytics, and the Office of General Counsel. And I also want to thank my friend Ben Downs of uh, Brian Broadcasting. He hosted me at his AM radio station in College Station, Texas, a few years ago, and among other things, planted a bug in my ear about this idea. I'm really glad that he and other dedicated advocates like him have so ably pushed this cause and so patiently done so. Uh, he firmly <laughs> believes of AM radio as uh, Freddie Mercury aptly said in the 1984 Queen hit Radio Gaga, uh, you had your time, you had your power, you've yet to have your finest hour. I certainly hope that's true as well for radio. So uh, with that, we'll proceed to a vote on the item. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly. Aye. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. And I will vote to approve as well. The item is adopted. Uh, thanks so much to the media. Oh, with editorial privileges granted as requested. Uh, thanks to the Media Bureau for the work. Uh, Madam Secretary, to item number six we go on today's agenda. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the sixth item is entitled Video Description, Implementation of the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act of 2010. The item will also be presented by the Media Bureau. And once again, Michelle Carey, Chief of the Bureau will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And uh, again, uh, Madam Ms. Gary, we turn the floor to you. Thank you. The next item the Media Bureau presents is a report and order that expands the Commission's audio description requirements to an additional 10 designated market areas each year for the next four years. This action, which comes at the 10 year anniversary of the landmark 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act or CVAA, will help ensure that a greater number of individuals who are blind or visually impaired can be connected, informed, and entertained by television programming. Joining me to present the item is Diana Sokolow of the Bureau's Policy Division. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, I am pleased to present this report and order that adopts the unopposed proposal to expand our audio description requirements to additional markets. 
Audio description utilizes the secondary audio stream to make video programming more accessible to individuals who are blind or visually impaired by inserting narrated descriptions of a television program's key visual elements during natural pauses in the program's dialogue. The Commission's audio description rules currently require certain broadcast stations in the top 60 DMAs to provide described programming. The CVAA provides that as of October 2020, the Commission may phase in the audio description requirements for up to an additional 10 DMAs per year if it determines that the costs are reasonable. Today's order concludes that the costs of expanding the audio description requirements to DMAs 61 through 100 are reasonable for program owners, providers, and distributors. Accordingly, the order phases in the audio description requirements for an additional 10 DMAs each year for four years, beginning on the later of January 1st, 2021, or the effective date of the order. The order further commits the Commission to consider in 2023 whether to continue expanding to an additional 10 DMAs per year beyond the top 100 DMAs. Finally, the order modernizes the Commission's terminology by substituting the more common and widely understood term audio description for the term video description. This would bring our rules into harmony with the terminology suggested by the Commission's Disability Advisory Committee and which is widely used by consumers and other federal agencies. The Media Bureau recommends that the Commission adopt the report in order and requests editorial privileges to make any necessary technical or conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you very much for that compelling presentation. That will now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner O'Reilly. Uh, no statement for me, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, Commissioner Carr. No separate statement. Thank you so much to the team for your work on this. Appreciate it. All right, uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel. Uh, as you heard, it was 10 years ago this month that the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act became the law of the land. I remember the day the bill was signed. That's because I was in the room, deep in the audience, present because I had the privilege of working on this legislation when I served as counsel to the United States Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. The glory of that day stays with me now. That's because this legislation was a big deal. It built on the foundation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. It helped pry open opportunity in the digital age by expanding access to technology for millions with disabilities. There's another reason that the glory of that moment lingers. At the signing ceremony, I sat near Stevie Wonder, who helped champion this legislation. So this was a good day. But what's better still is that the FCC is still at it. A decade in, and we are still using this law to expand access and improve opportunities for those with disabilities. It's a deal. It's Today, the in fact, the we are extending the agency's audio description requirements to an additional 10 markets every year for the next four years. So what does this mean? This technology makes video accessible to individuals who are blind and visually impaired by inserting narrative descriptions of key visual elements in television programming. So with audio description, those with vision loss no longer miss facial expressions, visual jokes, or critical scene changes. It makes more video content available to more of us and builds on the groundwork laid by the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act. As a result, it has my support. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Starks. Yes, thank you. No separate statement for me, but uh, deeply appreciate this hard work on something so important. Uh, so thank you uh, to the team. Uh, aptly said, Commissioner, and I too uh, will have a statement for the record, but in the interest of time, I will forego it and simply uh, thank the staff for the great work on this important issue. Uh, audio description is one of the many uh, areas in which the Commission is determined to make all of these technologies accessible to those with disabilities. And on each and every one of those initiatives, just know that you have our full support, uh, certainly in concept and in this case in practice. So thank you again, and we'll go to a vote. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly. Aye. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Approve. Commissioner Starts. Approve. And uh, the chair votes to approve as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks for all the great work. Uh, Madam Secretary, to the next item we go. We? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the seventh item on your agenda will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau and is entitled 
modernizing unbundling and resale requirements in an era of next generation networks and services. Chris Monteith, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Good. Thank oh, you very much. Excuse sorry me. about Ms. Martin, go ahead. <laughs> yes, the Wireline Competition Bureau is pleased to present for your consideration a report in order to modernize decades old unbundling and resale obligations that apply only to incumbent local exchange carriers. I would like to thank the entire Bureau team for their hard work on this item as well as our colleagues in the offices of economics and analytics and general counsel for their review and helpful feedback. Michelle Burlock, special counsel in the competition policy division will now present the item. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and commissioners. This report in order, if adopted, would update the commission's network unbundling requirements and eliminate its avoided cost resale requirements to reflect the dramatic changes that have taken place in the industry since Congress passed the Telecommunications Act of 90, 1996 over 24 years ago. The 1996 Act changed the focus of telecommunications law and policy from the regulation of monopolies to the encouragement of robust intermodal competition. To open the then monopoly local telephone market to competitive entry, the 1996 Act required incumbent local exchange carriers to offer unbundled network elements to new entrants at cost-based rates. It also required these incumbent carriers to offer their retail telecommunications services to competitors at regulated wholesale rates for resale to the competitor's customers. The report and order would modernize the Commission's unbundling and resale requirements to reflect the transformative changes in technology and competition since 1996. It would end unbundling and resale requirements where they stifle technology transitions and broadband deployment, but retain unbundling requirements where they are still necessary to realize the 1996 Act's goal of robust intermodal competition benefiting all Americans. First, the report and order would eliminate unbundling obligations for DS1 and DS3 enterprise loops in areas the Commission has already found competitive while preserving those requirements in areas without sufficient evidence of competition. It provides for a 42 month transition period for DS1 loops with new orders allowed during the first 24 months and a 36 month transition period for DS3 loops. Second, the report in order would eliminate, excuse me, would eliminate unbundling for broadband capable DS0 loops and subloops in the most densely populated areas while preserving them in less densely populated areas where there may be greater, greater barriers to broadband deployment. It would provide for a 48 month transition period with new orders allowed during the first 24 months incumbent local exchange carriers would be permitted to raise rates by up to 25% during the final 12 months of the transition period. Third, the report and order would eliminate unbundled voice grade narrow band loops, multi-unit premises, subloops, and network interface devices nationwide with a three-year transition period. Fourth, the report and order would eliminate unbundling requirements for dark fiber transport provisioned from incumbent carrier wire centers located within a half mile of a competitive fiber network, subject to an eight year transition period for existing unbundled dark fiber circuits, so as to avoid stranding investment and last mile deployment by competitive local exchange carriers that may harm consumers in the short to medium term. Fifth, the report and order would eliminate unbundled operations support systems nationwide, except for the purposes of managing other unbundled network elements, number portability, and in interconnection, with transition periods coinciding with those for the various unbundled elements. Finally, the report and order 
would forbear from the avoided cost resale obligation where it continues to exist, subject to a three-year transition period. The unbundling relief reflected in the report and order, particularly the varying transition periods for different network elements, is based upon record evidence unique to each element, including compromise proposals reached by the major industry buyers and sellers of these network elements. The Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming bits. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Perla, for your presentation. We'll now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no specific statement, but I'll just make a couple points. And this item sets forth a closure process of certain aspects of the 1996 Act and FCC rules in a thoughtful way. It's been a long ride for those of us who've been on that train. I appreciate the agreement reached between the differing sides, especially U.S. Telecom and Encompass, on this matter, and I thank you for finding common ground. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we now turn to Commissioner Card. In many respects, the, uh, the Telecom Act of 1996 has been a success. America's internet providers are now investing in building out their networks at a record, record pace. Uh, we've reached the point, I think, where rules intended to encourage investment can actually begin to hamper it. Technological convergence has allowed previously siloed industries to compete against one another. Fiber, fixed wireless, mobile 5G, low latency satellite, they can all compete to win customers from each other. And when you have a fiercely competitive market capable of attracting massive investment, it's time to take a fresh look at our rules. We do that with our decision today by updating our rules, and we do so in a way that's consistent with the important compromise reached by the private sector on these admittedly difficult issues. So I want to thank them for their effort to find common ground. And I want to thank the Wireline Bureau for their diligent work on this item. It has my support. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenwessel. Competition is at the heart of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. This law pried open communications markets that had never before seen the benefits of competition and in the process offered consumers new choices, lower rates, and greater innovation. To bring all of this about, it set up a new framework that expanded the number of carriers capable of offering communications and induced their entry into local markets. These policies opened elements of incumbent networks to competition and also made their services available on a resale basis. Over time, the FCC has adjusted and readjusted these policies. Our most recent effort at fine-tuning them kicked off with the rulemaking late last year. The good news is that following the release of our rulemaking, a group of incumbent network providers and competitive carriers came together to work on these issues. This summer, they proposed a compromise. They envisioned changes to our policies regarding the availability of unbundled network elements in populous areas, accompanied by transitions that would give the market time to adapt. Those who participated deserve kudos for their efforts. Reaching this point was a hard slog, and I want to thank them for their perseverance. The not so good news is that despite their efforts to forge this compromise, this decision still has deficiencies. While I support the fundamentals of their compromise, I think our analysis is lacking. It too casually dismisses concerns about competitive entry and too often asserts the presence of competition without additional evidence. I think this failing is most pronounced when it comes to broadband competition. In particular, I am concerned that this decision relies on analyses that overstate the presence of competition and do not meaningfully consider how the retirement of legacy facilities will impact the availability of consumer broadband in the future. For these reasons, I approve in part and dissent in part. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Starts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Last November, just a few months after our August 2019 forbearance decision, I concluded that there was not an urgent need for another proceeding and further abandonment of the tools that the 1996 Act gave the Commission to promote competition. I argued then, and still believe, that it would have been better to take more time to let the competitive consequences of our previous forbearance orders play out before moving forward with further deregulation. Despite those reservations, I recognize the many, many hard months of work 
that went into the compromise proposals offered in this proceeding by U.S. Telecom and Compass and many of their members. In recent years, simply participating in various forbearance proceedings has placed significant burdens on many smaller providers, and I understand the desire of all the parties involved to create some certainty for the coming years, and I deeply respect the party's judgment that the trade-offs reflected in the compromise are well worth it. I am pleased to approve the parts of today's decision that adopt the U.S. Telecom and Encompass Compromise proposals. At the same time, I continue to believe that further due regulatory action should be based on rigorous data, collection, reasoned analysis, and a careful look back at the results of the Commission's recent deregulatory actions. Not every change in the market or new technological development means that our pro-competition rules have become outmoded, outdated, or irrelevant. We have, as the last few months have made clear, a long way to go when it comes to solving internet inequality. Promoting competitive options remains an important part of that effort. And so for that reason, I will respectfully dissent with the remainder of the decision and thank the staff for their hard work on the item. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Some long running disputes are legendary. Others may lack notoriety, but are nonetheless important. And one of these is embedded in the Telecommunications Act of 1996. That landmark law marked a transition of our nation's communications law from the regulation of monopolies to the encouragement of robust competition. And over the last 24 years, almost a half quarter century, there's been an ongoing battle between well-established incumbent local exchange carriers, or LECs, and newer competitive LECs over how the FCC should implement key provisions of the act designed to facilitate that transition. That battle has been fought at the FCC, in the courts, and on Capitol Hill. The key flashpoint has been the 1996 Act's requirement that incumbent LECs make their networks available to new entrants at regulated cost-based rates. These network elements were unbundled, meaning the competitive LEC could pick and choose the combination of elements it wanted to lease and pay the associated rate for each element. Competitive LEX could then provide service to customers using these leased elements. Now, since the passage of the 1996 Act, incumbent LEX and competitive LEX have fiercely debated how broad these unbundling rules should be and their effectiveness in promoting competition. And given this contentious history, which I've had a chance to see firsthand, having sat through the 2002 Supreme Court argument over the total element long run incremental cost, if memory serves me correctly, uh, it is nothing short of remarkable that incumbent LEX and competitive LEX on their own have reached a compromise this year on the way forward with respect to our unbundling rules. And the rules that the commission adopts today largely reflect that compromise. And so I want to thank Encompass and U.S. Telecom respectively, in particular, uh, Chip Pickering and Angie Cronenberg at the former and Jonathan Spalter and Patrick Halley at the latter for leading the charge to find consensus on these difficult issues. I know that it was no easy task. It would be all too easy for each of you to retreat to your warring camps and simply continue fighting about this for another generation. But you have shown statesmanship in trying to solve these issues and flexibility in meeting your negotiating partners halfway. And I think that demonstrates that even the most intractable disputes in the communication sector and beyond can be resolved. Uh, our changes today strike the right balance. We get rid of some of these outdated regulatory obligations that stifle the deployment of broadband and innovation, uh, innovative new technologies. We also maintain certain requirements in parts of the country where competition hasn't yet taken root. And because we recognize that the market needs time to adjust to some of these changes, we impose a transition period that scales depending on the type of infrastructure we're talking about. So all in all, uh, this consensus, which we now ratify in large part, will promote much more innovation, competition, and deployment for years to come. Uh, for their work in shepherding uh, through this consensus here at the FCC, I want to thank the staff of the Wireline Competition Bureau, the Office of Economics and Analytics, the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, and the Office of General Counsel. We will now proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner O'Reilly? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Carr? Oh, Approve. Uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel? Approve in part, dissent in part. Uh, Commissioner Starks? Approve in part, dissent in part. And the chair votes to approve the item as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Uh, thanks again to the uh, Wireland Competition <laughs> presenters today. Uh, Madam Secretary, can you please announce the last item on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, last on your agenda, item eight, 
is an enforcement action for your consideration. The item will be presented by the Enforcement Bureau. Rosemary Harold, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. And before introducing Ms. Harold, uh, because this order is an enforcement related matter, we're going to switch up the order that we do things as we typically have done in presentations involving a forfeiture order at an open meeting. As with all open meeting items, the Bureau circulated this item to every commissioner's office at least three weeks ago. Uh, but there's a longstanding practice, of course, at the agency that we don't publicly disclose the target of an enforcement action unless and until the commission decides to take that action. Uh, for this item, this means that the agency formally votes on the item. Then here's a brief presentation from the Enforcement Bureau staff, and then we'll turn to any statements that commissioners might have on the item. Uh, this process ensures that the target won't be publicly disclosed until we voted to take action. We're going to follow that precedent here, and so now we will proceed directly to a vote on the item, item number eight on today's agenda, class number 200142. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly? Yes, in part, no, in part. Commissioner Card? Approved. Commissioner Rosenworcel? Approved. Commissioner Starks? Approved. Approved. Uh, the chair votes to approve as well. The item is adopted with editorial priv privileges granted, as I anticipate might be requested at the end of the presentation. Speaking of which, we now turn to Ms. Harold for that presentation. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Thank you for your consideration and your votes on today's item, a forfeiture order addressing violations of the Truth in Caller ID Act. Presenting with me is Christy Thompson, Chief of EB's Telecommunications Consumers Division. I would also like to thank Lisa Gelb, Deputy Bureau Chief, Shana Yates, Deputy Division Chief, Kimberly Taylor, an attorney advisor, Shante Willis, another of our attorney advisors, and Shannon Lipp, one of our front office legal advisors, for their work on this investigation, as well as the Office of General Counsel for its invaluable support. Christy will now present the item. Good afternoon, uh, sorry, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. This forfeiture order confirms the findings of an earlier notice of apparent liability and assesses a forfeiture of $37,525,000 against Affordable Enterprises of Arizona, LLC. This company unlawfully altered the caller ID information of many millions of robocalls, a practice known as spoofing. For 14 months in 2016 and 2017, Affordable made more than 2.3 million spoofed telemarketing calls offering home improvement services. Many of the calls displayed phone numbers that were unassigned or assigned to innocent third parties unaffiliated with Affordable. Other calls displayed phone numbers associated with anonymously registered prepaid burner phones. Affordable knowingly used caller IDs that it was not authorized to use and hid its identity from the people that it called. Affordable intended to harm the recipients of its calls who could not identify the caller and could not reliably reach Affordable to ask to be removed from future calls. The company called consumers listed in the do not, National Do Not Call Registry. Affordable also harmed the innocent consumers who were the rightful users of the phone numbers that it wrongfully displayed in caller ID, subjecting them to angry callbacks from other consumers. Affordable engaged in this spoofing to gain something of value. First, it sought to gain customers and increase revenues. Second, it intended to gain a shield against being identified and subject to law enforcement and consumer litigation. For these reasons and the additional detail laid out in the forfeiture order, the Enforcement Bureau appreciates the Commission's adoption of this item and the grant of editorial privileges. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Thompson, for the presentation and to all of EB for the great work on this item. And we'll now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner O'Reilly. No statement for me. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Card. No separate statement. Thanks to the team for their work on this important issue. All right. Uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel. No statement for me as well. Uh, Commissioner Starks. Uh, I will submit the statement uh, for the record, but thanks for the hard work uh, from EB. All right. Well, I do have a statement, but, uh, you know, look, who am I to uh, be nonconformist in this regard? So I'm certainly going to uh, submit it for the record. But in the meantime, uh, simply say that we appreciate the hard work that 
the Enforcement Bureau has done over a long period of time. It's uh, gathering all the facts, getting us to the NAL, getting us to the forfeiture order. It's a slog, and we couldn't have done the slog without you. So thank you for the great work. Um, the item's already been adopted, so EB, you're home free. But do any of my colleagues have any uh, comments at this or announcements at this time? Oh, anybody? Yeah, no, oh. I do. Yeah, I do too. Jump in and go ahead. Okay. I, um, I really want to um, congratulate Umair Javed in my office, my wireless advisor. On October 9th, he and his wife rec um, uh, are now the proud parents of a new baby boy, Ilias. And uh, Ilias joins his older brother and older sister. And um, everyone seems to be healthy and well. We miss Umer terribly in the office. We are excited that he has become a father of three. And we wish him all sorts of luck and um, hope he's capable of getting some sleep. And while he's out and um, celebrating the arrival of a new little one, I just want to point out that we are so fortunate to have Arkansas's finest, Mary Claire York, helping out in our office. She is special counsel in the mobility division, um, someone I've known for years and years. I've always been so impressed with her work, and she stepped in and has not missed a beat preparing for this meeting, and I am so grateful that she's willing to do so. And one final thing in my office, we do have an intern that we've been working with um, since Jessica Martinez left for Congressman Mark Beasy's office. We brought in an intern to help out with some research. Um, we have Anna Hava from working with us. She uh, is someone who grew up in Spain then came to Washington and worked on Capitol Hill for Congressman Tony Cardenas. And she is now finishing up her law degree at Harvard. And while she's doing that, she is doing some work on the side and helping research uh, issues in our office. And we are so grateful to have her um, pitching in at this time, too. So. That's a whole bunch of personnel announcements for me, but um, I'm getting them out in one fell swoop. And um, we're very excited that um, Umer and his wife uh, have a new little one in their lives. And um, again, we offer him our congratulations. Uh, congratulations indeed to everybody, especially Umer going to the zone defense is no joke. So good luck to you, man. Uh, Commissioner Riley, I think you had- uh, Yes, uh, I did. Thank you. And congrats to Umer and his family I've only got two, and so three is a whole different level that I couldn't handle. And, and congrats to Mary Claire, uh, who I know from my time on the Hill as well, a wonderful person. I know her and her husband many years ago. I only bother everyone to announce a departure from my office. Yvonne Walker, uh, she is the first, but probably won't, won't be the last departure. Uh, I want to thank her for her work. She was the first and friendly face you saw in my office uh, when we could actually meet in person. Uh, she provided immense and valuable work to my team. Uh, and is such a great person and would do wonderful work uh, going forward. And so I want to thank her and wish her well in the future. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, uh, Commissioner. I've got a few announcements of my own as well. Uh, first, on an unfortunate note, I wanted to note the passing of two individuals who are important in our space. Uh, first, uh, Monica Parham. Uh, she is an extended member of our FCC family. Uh, she passed away earlier this week, as it happens. She was a standout member of on the Diversity in Tech Working Group of the Advisory Committee on Diversity and Digital Empowerment, uh, following my rechartering of that committee in 2017. She's a highly regarded expert in diversity and inclusion issues, and she gave us invaluable expertise uh, at the commission in our examination of recruitment firms, including uh, several firms that are household names. Uh, that committee has really done a lot of work, including publishing the 2019 Tech Diversity Best Practices Report in June of 2019. And because of Monica's steady hand uh, and her knowledge of the industry, that report is pretty comprehensive. It includes the most up-to-date thinking and some recommendations on ways we can improve diversity and inclusion in the tech sector. So uh, we're very proud and grateful to have had the chance to benefit from Monica's expertise and express our condolences to her loved ones and her friends, including those at the commission and on the diversity committee. Uh, next. I want to announce the unfortunate passing of Mr. Ken Robinson. Uh, Ken had a storied career in the communications sector, and that's frankly understating the case. Uh, he started off in the early 1970s, uh, hired by Clay Whitehead, who was then a special assistant to President Nixon, to work in the Office of Telecommunications Policy. And to give you a sense of who he was working with, uh, down the hall from him was Henry Goldberg of the eponymous law firm we all know, as well as uh, Brian Lamb, now of C-SPAN's fame. And the general counsel at the time was some unknown lawyer named Antonin Scalia. So he was in pretty good company uh, at the time. 
He then, in 1978, when President Carter got, abolished the OTP and set up the NTIA, which was the successor to it, he went to NTIA, serving as an advisor to several different adv administrators of different parties, including President Reagan's last NTIA head, Alfred Sykes. When President George H.W. Bush appointed uh, then uh, Administrator Sykes to be Chairman Sykes, uh, Mr. Robinson followed him there, serving the agency as senior legal and policy advisor, involved in many, many different issues, but the most significant was his work on developing the procedures for the first auction of radio frequency spectrum licenses, work that, as many of you know, was recently recognized with a Nobel Prize to Paul Milgram and to Robert Wilson. And also for over 30 years, uh, Mr. Robinson was the publisher, the sole author and publisher of the Telecommunications Policy Review, or TPR. It was an eclectic newsletter uh, covering telecom, movie reviews, uh, gardening tips, and even motorcycles. Uh, Mr. Robinson was a BMW fan, and it really uh, tied a lot of people together. Uh, just to give you a few a sense of the impact he left, former Chairman Sykes sent over these has sent over these comments. Few are legendary. Ken is one. Ken was not without opinions on public policy, but he served successfully for conservative and liberal administrations because he always brought facts to the table. Uh, also, uh, Chairman Fowler, Mark Fowler said, "I will miss Ken. Truly, an unforgettable man. The one person I knew who watched over the air television with rabbit ears on a small twenty-year black and white set." Uh, he was my friend as much as his endearing quirkiness permitted. Henry Goldberg said Ken had an intimate knowledge of the federal telecom bureaucracy and, of course, bureaucracy in general, hence his love of Yes Minister. Uh, the great Terry Haynes said, yeah, Ken made me think and improve my understanding every single time we crossed paths for over 30 years in print and in person. I can't think of anyone else I can say that about. Uh, last but not least, Charles Schott said that he was also a fabulous and fun curmudgeon in the context of any formal organization. I particularly remember when we got to the FCC, him telling everyone in the chairman's office that he wanted to be designated by the managing director's office as a roving smoking area. Um, actually, you know, the last one I, I will, uh, this is actually a very apt one for 2020 and beyond, uh, from Andrew Margeson. In recent times, we went back and forth regularly about a very wide range of policy issues on an almost weekly basis. We might disagree, but even when we did, especially when we did, we were friends. That is very special and what we sorely need more of in this country. That is his legacy to me. Uh, to Ken's friends and family, uh, we appreciate his service to the commission and to the country, and we express our deepest sympathies to all of you. Uh, on to a happier note, uh, we do have a few additions to the office of the chairman. Uh, first, uh, and I was receiving some requests about whether this intern would appear or not. Uh, she is with me actually in the office today, and uh, that is uh, Ginger the Bulldog. She, uh, arrived a couple of weeks ago, and she's already off to a fast start tweeting uh, at a lot of Bulldog, as you might have seen. Uh, just, I can't control these kids these days on social media, but uh, she's been a great addition to the office, increasing the uh, morale of the office, uh, you know, occasionally adding a few little touches here and there on the floor, but you know, that's to be expected. So we're very happy that Ginger is with us uh, today, um, and my son Alexander there, too. Hi. <laughs> um, uh, who last appeared at a commission meeting in 2014 when he was uh, two and a half years old. So how about that? Uh, Slate Herman also is an intern in our office. Slate hails from my home state of Kansas. He grew up in northern Colorado. He received his undergrad degree from Grand Canyon University in Phoenix, Arizona, where he was a student body president. He's now in his third year at the University of Colorado Law School. Uh, he's interested in the intersection of cybersecurity and national security, pretty hot topic, and hopes to work in government service after graduation, which we, of course, encourage. Uh, during the pandemic, Slate's picked up the fine sport of pickleball, and he's taken up the hobby of smoking meats. Ah, uh, to be young. And, of course, he has the most important qualification for working in OCH. He's a Chiefs fan. Good, good work, Slate. Uh, next is Evelyn Johns. Evelyn is a Northern Virginia native. She graduated from Stanford, where she majored in international relations, focusing on Europe, Russia, and international security, uh, thereby greatly disappointing her parents, who thought that she would be an engineer. Just be glad they didn't think you were going to medical school, Evelyn. I can tell you all about that. Uh, anyway, she uh, ignored all of the advice from her senior fellows at, in policy and decided to start studying for the LSAT and apply to law school. As she puts it, she is currently a 2L at the, quote, Zoom School of Law. Oh, sorry. I mean, George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School. Uh, before COVID, she enjoyed playing tennis, hiking, and traveling. And now she enjoys doing FCC-related research. Uh, last but not least is Alexander Kropicki. Alexander is a native of Springfield, Massachusetts, the home of basketball. He received his undergrad degree in electrical engineering from the University of Virginia, uh, and he's currently a law student in his final year at George Mason Law School, where he says he's currently uh, not give, getting enough sleep. He's fluent in Polish, so 
This is my one chance to uh, try out my one Polish phrase, uh, po polsku. I think that's right. He speaks Polish, which I don't, except for that. Uh, and he has a wide range of interests, including fencing and Japanese bonsai. Uh, we have a lot of polymaths in the office on a temporary basis, as you can see. Uh, so grateful to have all of them with us. And I also want to remember those, as I mentioned, who have passed. Uh, Madam Secretary, with that, if my colleagues don't have any other announcements, can you announce the date of the next FCC agenda meeting? The next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission is Wednesday, November 18th, 2020. All right. And with that, we are adjourned. Stay well, everybody. See you later.